Holy crap. People persist in doubting the evidence. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We're putting all of our antennas towards the Jimmy Church on Dark Matter Radio. <laughs> and now, your host, the captain of Conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church Fade to Black. All right, all right, all right. Let's go. This is Fade to Black. Oh, man, what a news day. All right, let's go. Let's get this one cracking in Space Boy. I see that. Have we have we dropped the C and cracking so it's just like cracking? All right, I get it. That'd be a good T-shirt. This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world. Today is Thursday, July 17th. We are 185 days into the new year. It's not really a new year when you're 185 days into it, but I do it every day. So there you go, 185 days, just in case you were wondering. We are live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in Burbank, California for KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Welcome, everybody, hither and thither. To and fro, back and forth, far and near. Wow. Europe right now. Ooh, man. Mediterranean. Insane news day. Big proud salute to the men and women in uniform. Protecting our right for free speech. <laughs> day like today is a day you really need to think about it. Without them, there is no me, there is no you, there is no us, and you cannot hear me right now, and I really need you to think about that. All right, let's go. I see everybody's here. Carrie just tweeted, it's the 18th anniversary of TWA Flight 800, and isn't that interesting? And you know what? I had that in my show notes right here in front of me. I've got to say that is disturbing at in the very least that is uh absolutely crazy all right let's go i'm ready we got a lot to talk about tonight man oh man let's uh let's at least get some happy stuff out of the way today bassist geezer butler a man that changed Four strings for all of us. Geezer Butler is 65 years old. Still doing it, too. Geezer, brother. Geezer Butler, 65. Man. All right. I'm going to get a tweet going right now. What's what's the best Black Sabbath album? I've got mine. No, I have two. I have a tie. I'll just tell you right now. Sabotage and Never Say Die, their last album. With uh, with Ozzy, those are my two favorites. There's a couple of other good ones, but Sabotage and Never Say Die stick out for me. All right, that first Ronnie D album was pretty good though too. So that that's our Geezer Butler tribute. I'm just curious what Fader Knots think of that top ten today. Actor Donald Sutherland is 79 years old. And it's kind of sad because today he's now known as Kiefer's dad. (laughs) Canadian actor. The whole family's Canadian uh, from Toronto. He played Hawkeye Pierce in the 1970 movie MASH, as we all remember. But my two other favorites for him, well, I have three. The Eagle Has Landed, which still I love to this day. The Dirty Dozen, amazing. But a film that we left off the top 10, 
Invasion of the Body Snatchers. We left that one off. That's an honorable mention. I don't think it's quite good enough to make the top 10, but Donald Sutherland, 79, still doing it too. Still doing it. Still doing it. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. That's what you want to do. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. And then you're going to hashtag DM Radio Net. And that way I'll be able to see all of your tweets in real time. We use TweetDeck here at the JP Motorsports Studios. An effortless Twitter box. There you go, Lou. Twitter box. <laughs> all right. Facebook, YouTube. We got the Van Dan uh Von Daniken ready uh for YouTube uh today. So man, I can't believe how much email we got about that. Okay, it's coming. It'll it'll be up. It'll be up by the morning. All right. I promise. Von Daniken. A lot of people miss that show. And uh so there you go. YouTube is a KJCR fade to black. And like I had announced on the show last night, we took all of the archives off of the website. Everything, anything media related, anything we had it stored on there in the wrong way in the first place. But the website is, is uh, pretty ripping now. And it's funny. I got, got a couple of emails today. Jimmy, I missed the website. I quit going, but I'm back and it's fast. Thank you. Well, you know, my apologies. My apologies. All right. Tonight, Linda Moulton Howe on the show tonight from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And, oh, I, I wanted to say this. Right before the show tonight, it was about uh, about 20 minutes ago, my phone rings. I'm in the studio and I look. It's John B. Wells. John B. Wells. And I was, oh, picked it up. Jimmy, John B. How you doing, John? I'm pretty good. And you know what? That is not a voice effect. That is the real deal. <laughs> and uh, I got to say, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun tomorrow night. And and I think we all know John B. He does. He's like, let's bring it. Let's do it. All right. And uh, he, uh, I will be on his show too. I'll be on uh, Caravan to Midnight on the 28th, and I'm looking forward to that. And I consider that an honor. Um, it's going to be great. And listening to uh, the two of us today on the phone, and I'm, I'm trying to speak in a higher pitch so I know who's talking. <laughs> so I don't know what's going to go on tomorrow. We're going to have to have subtitles. And uh, to, so everybody will know who's speaking. But, yeah, tomorrow I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, the obvious subjects that need to be covered, I promise they will all be covered. All right? And I'm really looking forward to it. So there you go. That'll be tomorrow night. Tonight, Linda Moulton Howe. And uh, let's get a couple of things out of the way. Let's just do this. Let's just go through the standard stuff and get it out of the way. We will have open lines tonight. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with MH17. I want everybody's opinions and thoughts on it. It was, a, and not only that, but you have and on the same day, Israel blowing into Gaza. And that's not what this show is about. The show isn't about politics and what's going on out there. Don't, don't care. You can go somewhere else and listen if that's what you want. You're not going to get that here. But what it does make is for a crazy emotional day. That's what it causes. And couldn't, couldn't Netanyahu just have paused and just delayed things until tomorrow? Do you, got, do you really got to do that? You know what just happened. Do you really got to pull that kind of trigger when you don't really probably need to go in there anyway? I don't know. You would just think that they could deal with things in another way. But but anyway, wow, what a crazy, crazy news day. And I'll say this to everybody because I know you're all thinking it, so I'll say it out loud. You never know when you wake up in the morning what you're going to face. You just don't know, do you? You don't, you don't know, you know, you don't, you're not listening to the news. You're not doing anything. You jump in the car, you're driving to work, turn on the radio and bam, something crazy is going on. And you just don't know what the day is going to bring. 
Now, I'm going to say this really quick. I don't mean to get all kumbaya and emotional, but you never know what the day is going to bring you. And I have a strict rule in my house with my family, my kids, my wife, my wife, my wife. And that is when you hang up that phone, when they're walking out the door and, and, and that's it. And you're parting ways, you turn to them and you just make sure everything is, is good. You say, I love you. You make sure that everything is just where it needs to be because you never know. You don't, you never know. And that's, that's it. And so like, just like today, think about what happened to everybody on MH17. Tra-la-la, flying home, maybe going on vacation, maybe flying back from vacation, a successful business trip. And you've got some yacht who, trigger happy guy, is going to shoot a missile at your plane. A civilian plane? That's insane. You never know. So that's 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 it. That's how I live my life. That's how I do it. I make sure I'm cool with everybody. <laughs> Even the people I don't like. I just make sure the last memory that they if it ever comes down, the last memory they have of me was, man, that guy, that guy was happy. That guy was cool. He said bye to me. He said hello to me. He said that, you know, that that's that's what I, you know, and that's what you should do. All right. That's it. That's my kumbaya message because I just hate days like this. Just absolutely crazy. And we're going to be talking about it all night. I was it, it, John B and I were talking before the show and and I said uh, crazy news day, huh? And he's like, "Yeah, man. I mean, just insane." And I said, here, I've got to go on the air here in a few minutes. And why can't it just be happy stuff? I just want to entertain. Just want to have a good time no matter what. And, you know, and I've got this on my brain, you know, and, and I have to talk about this tonight because I have to. And I want to. But, man, you know, you just never know what the day is going to bring. You know, it was supposed to be, you know, a nice, fun show with Linda Moulton Howe, and let's just talk about UFOs. You know, and here we are. Got to talk about MH17, and I'm going to. I'm not happy about it. Um, now, uh, today, there was, uh, oh, let's get a couple things out of the way. See, I'm all wound up over this. Just all wound up. Contact in the desert now that JimmyChurchRadio.com is fast and running. Get over there, get to jimmychurchradio.com, log in, log in, open the page, scroll down, get to contest in the desert or contact in the desert and enter and win. Tomorrow we're going to announce another round of winners. I'm going to try to get another round in before next week's show. Okay, that's the goal. I want to I, I want another round of winners. Uh what I don't want to do is is get a bunch of contest winners out there and then they don't have a way to make arrangements and get out here to California and, and go. So, you know, I want to be fair with everybody. Make sure you have a chance to do it. All right. So contact in the desert. There it is. Click on the poster. Takes you right over to the Jimmy church fade to black page and enter the contest. This is a four day, $400 pass. And everybody's going to be there. And I say it every night, but it's true. Sukalos, Von Daniken, Greer, Wilcock, Pope, Martell, Dolan, West, Linda. Linda's going to be there. Linda Moulton Howe. You can't just say how. But Dr. Lynn Katai is going to be there. Alejandro Rojas, Marshall Klarfeld, Laura Eisenhower. I wonder if she's going to have the braids and the beads. That's the thing. I, I got to check that out. Same thing with Sukalos. Uh, when I met, <laughs> I met George uh, a few years ago, right when Ancient Aliens was taking off. It was like the first season, second season. And I go, uh, he's speaking at a MUFON thing. So I go, go to hang out. Tried to get him on my sports show is, is why I showed up there. But, uh, which I didn't. But, I, and I just wonder, is he going to do the hair? 
And he walked in and he looked just like Don King. <laughs> three feet three feet high. So I'm sure it's going to be really cool to see in person again. So contact in the desert. Go and enter and win. Tomorrow uh, we will announce another round of winners. All right? All right. Okie dokie. What are we going to do now? Last week the winners were Darcy Lund, Thomas Peake, Sandra Rios. Do another round tomorrow. And there you go. So now, listen, I'm going to take my first break. I'm going to do that. When I come back, I'm going to go through some email, do some MH17. All right? And then right after that, at the bottom of the hour, Linda Moulton Howe. Tomorrow night, John B. Wells. John B. Wells will be here. Well, from Texas. Caravan to Midnight. Going to be cool. This is Bespoke Radio for the masses. Shoot me an email right now to Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Follow us on Twitter at JChurchRadio. This is Fade to Black only, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'll be back right after this. Don't touch that mouse. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444 or go check out their website www.nattaxexperts.com that's n-a-t-t-a-x-e-x-p-e-r-t-s dot com tell them Jimmy sent you this is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Is the music too loud? Sounds good in my cans. It just might be too loud. Maybe I'll start to chill it out. Can't help it. Oh, you know what? Sabbath album I left out? Technical S Ecstasy. Technical Ecstasy. That was a good one, too. Moving Parts. Yeah, it's a good album. This is Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Follow us right now on Twitter at J Church Radio. At J Church Radio. Hashtag DM Radio Net. Go hang out on Tweet Deck with us, man. It's cool. I'm serious. Go hang out. And and everybody over there is pretty friendly. Just don't try to stir the pot too much because you'll get run out of Dodge. But uh absolutely. At J Church Radio, hashtag DM Radio Net. Also, we have the new mobile version of JimmyChurchRadio.com, uh, too. It's very cool. And tune in is right there. So if you, you, know, if you are so mobile inclined, uh, I hope everybody's happy with that. It's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's simple, but cool. And the only thing you need to know about this show <laughs> and a mobile phone is click on tune in. That's it. That's all you got to do. Done. That's it. That's all you need. Like I said last night, we should have a one-page site. Uh, emails. We got so much to talk about tonight, so let's bang this out really quick. This one from Brian. 
And I'm reading this one first because this came in today. This is the first email about MH17. And it was right after it happened. And it was instantaneous. So uh, I thought I'd read this first. There was so much of it, but this is the first one. This is very strange. Civilian aircraft would be diverted around a hostile airspace. This is a common practice. The only places in the world where this is not common are places like Israel, where there is a constant attack, where there are constant attacks and a major airport. And uh, I got to agree. And what was funny was that was addressed today, too, in the media. They actually uh, took the time to do that. But uh, absolutely right. You know, probably the safest place to land anywhere in the world is Israel, no doubt. All right, now check out this email I got from AOL. Now, remember last week, Mark Weinstein on the show, okay? This came from an AOL staffer. Name is not used, but it's from AOL. You ready? It says, FYI. The male team here is incredibly pro-privacy, and we don't look at customer mail, nor do we allow access without an FBI warrant, and that is only in extreme cases. That being said, I don't trust the NSA wiretapping cables in or out of data centers in general, and that goes for any company's data centers, not just AOL. By the way, we still have millions of users. <laughs> Uh, yeah, gotta love it. You never know who's listening to this show. There was more to that email. I had to, I had to edit some of it out. I didn't want to expose this person and, and get them in any trouble. But uh, the last line of the email is what cracked me up. We still have millions of users. So there you go. AOL. I've gotten one AOL email in a year here on this show. Think about how much email rolls in here. One, one AOL email. And AOL's probably listening right now. Go ahead, right? I would like to know <laughs> how many. Uh, okay, this one is a good one. We all forgot to include the first Men in Black movie in our top 10 sci-fi films list. That came in from Renee, and I had to backpedal on that thought. And she's right. She's right. I, I don't know how I should be ashamed with, with all the men in black promotion that Dale did for the show. And I sh <laughs> should have thought of that because it is a great movie. All right. This one came in from Rick. Hey, Jimmy, do you really think it was a Ukrainian separatist or do you think it was Putin trying to gain traction in his efforts to take that area back for Russia? The guy is old school KGB. That doesn't just go away. Things just got a little dark. And he is 100% correct. And what was funny today was Putin's response Putin's response to MH7, well, you know what? Uh, it's Ukraine's fault. Huh? <laughs> what? We don't even know who, who pulled the trigger, but he jumped on that. He just, it, it's Ukraine. How could it be Ukraine's fault, especially if it was one of your missiles? How could it be Ukraine's fault? Or if it's not, and as, you know, the news reports today are, that uh, the separatists had, uh, you know, commandeered and overran a base last week and, and got one of the Buk, B-U-K, the Buk missile uh, launchers and uh, paraded that around town, took pictures of it, put it on Facebook. I'm not kidding. And so, yeah, okay, all right. But you still told them how to shoot the thing. And, yeah, Putin's response was uh, just uh, too much. I was expecting, uh, I was expecting, and maybe things will change by tomorrow, but Putin, I would think, is just going to back up and do the diplomatic thing and just pull back because now we've got civilian planes falling out of the sky. And that is where you pump the brakes. That's where you back up. 
That is not cool. It's not. So that's I I I would just think because whatever you think of him is one thing, but you don't want to prove people's suspicions of you. That's what you don't want to do. You want to keep them on your on their toes. So I would suspect that he would just back up. I would expect him to just back up, pull his troops back, back just just back off on everything and let everything chill and let this thing play out diplomatically. And whoever was interfacing and who was at reprimand those guys, have your scapegoat. And and handle it like that. That's what I expect to happen. I do. So there's my crystal ball. And we posted today a tweet. Now, this post went out on Facebook. I did it on Twitter, too, as well. And uh, the producers here caught this. And it was a tweet that came out of Kiev today from... Uh, a worker at the airport in Kiev, I believe somebody in the tower, I believe somebody in the tower, flight controller, something, air traffic controller, and he tweeted. Now, the tweet was in Spanish. His Twitter handle is at Spain Buca, B-U-C-A. And he was going on and on and on. And it was in Spanish. So I posted on Facebook and Twitter uh, the post and asked for some translations. And and I got a few of them via email and also on Facebook. And you can go to Facebook if you want to see the translations yourself. All of the translations that I got, basically, well, they were word for word. They were pretty much spot on. Also, an old buddy of mine, Mike Rollins. Uh, Mike, if you're listening right now. Uh, good job out of San Francisco. I didn't know he spoke Spanish, but uh, he also translated too as well. So I got a bunch of them in. They all said the same thing. And this is what I got. Uh, this translation is from Felipe Fotans. The first Twitter post says, the military people under the direction of the interior ministry knew at every moment what was happening. Now, remember, this is a air traffic controller out of Kiev in Ukraine. Now think about that tweet. This is the next tweet. A minute later. For those who do not know, let's put it this way. There are military people under the command of the defense and military under the command of the interior ministry. Next tweet. The high-ranking officials did not order the missile strike, Someone pulled the trigger in Ukraine's name. Next tweet. The military satellites did capture all of the data about the missile shot upwards towards the airplane. Civilian radars did not. And he works at the airport in Kiev. So when you read through this, obviously he is pointing a strange finger at somebody somebody that, without the authority, decided to shoot this plane down, trying to create an issue. Now, that's, what he, that's, that's the accusation here. And I, until we find out where this missile took off from, was it inside of Ukraine? Was it from the other side of the Russian border? Was it in the area of... Uh, that is under the control of the separatists? We don't know. We will find out. The The strange thing about all of this, I haven't really heard a mention of it today in mass media, or uh, not only on the news with the talking heads, but in print. And this is kind of weird. But I don't know how many planes Malaysia has. I don't. I don't know how many 777s they own. I don't. It's a tiny country. They can't have many. It's not like the United States. So they can't have many. What are the odds? What are the odds of two Boeing 777s disappearing like that in a three-month period? Somebody tell me. What are the odds? You know what they say. 
it's safer to, you know, you'll get struck by lightning before you get in a plane crash. Not if you live in Malaysia. Think about that. I don't get it. And are these in any way tied together? I don't know. But what are the odds? I'm just saying. This is where I just step back and go, you're kidding me. What are the odds? In the United States, have we had two catastrophic things happen like that in a three, four-month period? No. I don't think so. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, Rick Sennett just tweeted, it goes in threes. Let's hope not. All right. I'm ready. You ready for Linda? Let's take a break. When I come back, Linda Moulton Howe. Here on Fade to Black. I would say only on the Dark Matter Radio Network, but, you know, Linda's on Coast to Coast every week, so there you go. And I wonder how they feel about that. (laughs) Yeah. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us, everybody. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oi, oi, I'm Rhys Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is a revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network, the spoke radio for the masses. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Now, follow us on Twitter right now, at Radio. If you want to hashtag DM Radio Net, go hang out with everybody. TweetDeck is the source. And uh, let's get this cracking. I'm ready. I'm excited. Linda Moulton Howe is an Emmy Award-winning TV producer, investigative reporter for radio and internet, an author who goes directly to the men and women at the forefront of science and environmental breakthroughs and to a firsthand eyewitnesses of high strangeness. Howe has received two dozen TV production and journalism awards for excellence. Earthfiles.com received the 2006 W3 Silver Award for Excellence in the news category the 2003 Web Award for Standard of Excellence, and the 2000 Encyclopedia Britannica Award for Honoring Internet Excellence. Earth Files is an award-winning news website where experts, eyewitnesses, and viewers share the latest updates in Earth and astronomical mysteries. Beginning in 1999, Earth Files now has more than 2,000 science environment and real X-Files reports in chronological sequence, that include more than 20,000 images and documents in the growing archive and an ever-increasing current news. The in-depth reports go beyond the 6 o'clock news. I would like to humbly welcome to the program Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, how are you? Well, thank you, Jimmy Church. That was a nice introduction. I appreciate it. And it shows me how things keep growing and everything changing so rapidly. I'm now up to... Nearly 3,000 reports and some 55,000 illustrations, images, and documents. And what I 
wasn't certain about in 1999 when I set out to do earthfiles.com as sort of a crossroads for me where science, environment, medicine, and the real X-Files would cross in an intersection with audiences, I didn't realize at the time how for me, consequential it would be to have every single report, image, document, everything in chronological order. Now it is 2014. That means for 15 years it has been evolving in chronological order. So now, in addition to being a news website, it is like an encyclopedia. Abso- well, absolutely. And Linda, I have to ask you, do you do it yourself? Or, uh, you know, do you have a team behind you? Because... It's it's an excellent website, but like you're saying, it is it's turned into a monster. Do you do it yourself? Right, and it is lots of work, and I do all of the reports, the writing, the editing, the production, the audio myself. I do have a uh, he's a software guru in Toronto that I go to when I need to change or update or problems. I work with a Final Cut Pro editor in Albuquerque when I have to work on video or complicated audio. And I have uh, two transcribers that work for me. So that is the back channel work, but it grew out of my own personal desire. It's been like that ever since I graduated from Stanford Uh, University in Palo Alto, California, with a master's degree in communication where I made documentary films with Stanford University for two years, one for the Medical Center and one with the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And I have always found that it's only when I can get into a subject and go like a dentist drill as deeply as I can go. And when you do that, you begin to get stories, details, and all kinds of feedback into your, it's like it goes into every crevice of your being. And when you work that way, or when I work that way, that's when I think that my intuition also kicks in, and I have insights that I follow up, and it is those insights following them up through my career that have I would say most of the time they have led me to the next step, the next level, the next direction that right now today in 2014, the miles that I have traveled simply in one subject that everybody's interested in, and that's the what started out as animal mutilations that law enforcement told me back in 1979 when I was working at Channel 7 as director of special projects, Linda, let me do you, you a favor. The, uh, the perpetrators of animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. And the first time that the first sheriff said that looking to me in my eyes, I want you all to know it was like being hit with a a 220-volt circuit or something that felt actually electrical. I was so shocked. So I understand that the general audience that has not walked these paths this deeply have sat with people who are government whistleblowers in military and intel, uh, who have been with people before they died, Mm -hmm. that I understand the depth and the breadth of a lot of this non-human interaction with the earth coming through whistleblowers and that my goal in earth files and all of my work since i did a strange harvest about the animal mutilations which are directly related to the non-human interaction with this planet is that i feel and i jimmy i'd be very interested in your perception on this but i have always felt that it is only in knowledge that we have strength. If we are in a government that has a policy of denial and that we are kept out of all the loops for 60 years since World War II, I think that weakens not only the American population, but all people of this planet. If we had all the knowledge that all the governments have had for 60 years or longer, then we might not have been so vulnerable. We might not have fought each other so much. What's happening in the Ukraine and the Middle East, old Mesopotamia right now, might not be happening if we had other truths about interactions with this planet. 
I talk about that all the time. And yes, and I would like to talk about that tonight. And not only that, this is the thing. With with you, with Linda Moulton Howe, you know, with you, uh, you've always kept us on the edge of our seats uh, on coast to coast. You're coming on and you've got your breaking stuff and you're riding around in the car listening to you and then writing stuff down while you drive. I got to check this out when I get home, you know, and 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 that's what you have done for us. And you need to be congratulated for that over the years. But but. Let's back up, and I want to get to all of the interesting things that you and I have been talking about all week that's going on. There's so many cool right. things that, that I want to get out of you tonight. But let's, let's back up to that incident in 1979 when, when he looked at you, you know, in your yeah. eyes and said it's, it's, it's E.T. The doing it. Right. Um, what, up to that point in your life, um, you were kind of – you know, running the straight and narrow, you know, Stanford and news reporting. It was uh, the UFO subject. Was that brand new to you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I had come from a childhood where my great love was astronomy. I had a telescope. I joined up with guys at school. We built telescopes. I loved hard science. I love learning about the universe. I love learning about anything in science. And when I was at Stanford, I was doing a film that they ended up using in the medical center for 19 years on a 19 year long medical project having to do with what happens when a woman has a premature baby and cannot touch it with her hands or her skin, but must go through those rubber gloves in those incubators that uh, the child must be protected when they're very young and that was such an interesting Stanford Medical Center question when I was at Stanford is there an impact between the mother not being able to touch a premature baby versus the normal touching and and not only touching but binding skin to skin that mothers all over the planet have done for centuries and the bottom line answer i did a very complicated split screen love working on it very demanding but fascinating because the goal was to learn is there any difference and the answer after 19 years it was published i think in the national academy of sciences they used my film the whole time the answer is yes. When the mother cannot have her skin touch the baby upon birth, they, it is statistically uh, significant about the difference in those children. And that led to all kinds of changes in terms of uh, getting the mother, even if the baby is very premature, those babies need to be touched skin to skin. It is something about the human creature that we thrive in a kind of close skinness as we are born and as we evolve. Well, those are the kinds of things, and I told that in some detail, to just set the stage for all of the work that I have done in my life, whether it was in school or in uh, news, I was a news street reporter in Los Angeles at KNBC uh, and, and got married and uh, ended up moving to Boston because my husband went to Harvard, and that's where I did all of the medical programming for the ABC station in Boston. It was like getting a medical de degree for two years, and I was part of a Peabody Award as a producer working in science and uh, medical uh, programming. And then we went to Denver, and it was there that I was hired to be director of special projects at the CBS station. And my job was to do one or two documentaries a year, live studio programs and news segments on anything breaking, meaning breaking news or developments in the state of Colorado in relationship to the United States of the world. So I covered astronaut training. I covered all kinds of issues comparing Los Angeles and Denver on the pollution challenges, all of that. And it was Colorado that was one of the center states when all of the animal mutilations began in the early 60s, actually. And then there was the famous story that went 
worldwide. This was headlines in both hemispheres, September 1967, and that was the horse. The name was actually Lady, and she was a mare. The reporters at the time got the sex and the name wrong and called it Snippy and a, and a male, but it was a female named Lady, and she was found stripped of flesh from the neck up. The brain had been removed in the skull. Every single piece of tissue had been removed from the base of the neck up uh, out to the end of the horse's nose. And inside what's called the mediastinum, that is the center barrel part of your chest, a horse's chest, it is where the heart, the lungs, the major organs in the upper part of the body are. And all of those organs in the mediastinum of that horse had been surgically removed. This was an estimate of a doctor who was a pathologist and hematologist. He was always known as the doctor who would not give his name, but went to the site to investigate that mutilated horse. It was John Altshuler, MD, pathologist and hematologist, spent a lot of his career at the University of Colorado Medical Center and then went out independently and founded his own lab. And it was my good fortune to work with him in uh, for about a decade. Uh, and he was hit by a bicycle and ended up dying before he should have. He was brilliant. He was courageous. He knew everything there was to know about blood and tissue. And it was John Altshuler who one day said, I want you to come over to the lab and look at something that I'm noticing between the, the tissue that you bring in from the field and tissue that I've gotten from a gynecologist who uses lasers in surgery. And he said, I wanted to see what laser surgery on human tissue looks like compared to what we are getting from the animal mutilation." And in his office at one of the stereoscope microscopes, he said, look at the image on the right. Now look at the image on the left. Linda, what is the difference? And what did and you the see? the one yeah. difference I could see were black grains on one side and no black grains on the other. And that's what I said to him. And he said, precisely. He said, we're carbon-based life forms. And if you take heat like a laser to any carbon-based life form tissue, whether it's a horse or a human, you're going to find these pepper grains of carbon where there has been heat. But on all of the mutilated animal excisions that I, oh God, dozens, I went out into the fields on case after case, and I would FedEx back in plastic containers that were all taped up inside of formalin to protect and preserve them. And actually, we used, uh, well, yes, we, we used various things. But what the bottom line was, he would get the tissue within, from me, within 24 to 48 hours. So it was very fresh. He would have it prepared, would look at it under a microscope, no black carbon residue. And he said to me that day, I don't know what the cutting instrument is, Linda, but whatever it is, it is cauterizing as it is ex uh, making the excision, but it is not leaving any carbon residue. And that was just one more piece of hard medical evidence that I was always trying to find. It was from Stanford on. I have always had a bias to try to get hard physical evidence, go to scientists of the highest credibility who would take on these difficult subjects, mm -hmm and always go to as many multiple witnesses to a phenomena, which has always been the rule in journalism that the New York Times and the Washington Post have lived by, and I try. Always get a minimum of two to three witnesses on any subject where there is phenomena so that you at least are reporting a cross-section. And I think, Jimmy, that is something that has begun... Uh, to go missing in a lot of stuff on the net. And you probably have the same challenge I do. We're in a world where things are moving more and more to not only 24-hour cycles, but hourly cycles of news. And something will break, whether it's YouTube or Twitter or a Facebook or something on the web, 
and none of us have a reality check because reality checks can take days. Right. Right. And and for you, this is this is uh indulge me for a second. When when you're watching uh, a video and uh, a UFO or ET type of video, whatever it is, but and 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 you come on the screen and and they're flashing those pictures of the cattle cattle mutilations and horse or whatever, and and that comes on that that's hard for most people, including myself, to look at. It's difficult, and I know. and here you are out there in person, and I've always wondered. How are you? De- how did you? How did you acclimate yourself to that and and get past it and then start to look at the science and 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 look at these mutilations from a different set of eyes instead of the shock and horror of what you're looking at? Now you've got to research it. How did you get past that? It's a very very good question, and I'll try to do it in the two parts that I know existed in my life and how I came to stand on different ground. The uh, first trip to Sheriff Tech's Graves up in northern Colorado was in a couple of weeks of research, and I was really at that point, I only knew newspapers and a few phone calls, and I had not yet been exposed in the field. And Sheriff Tech's Graves handed me a box of 266 color Polaroid photos that he had taken himself of uh, dozens and dozens of bloodless, trackless animal mutilations up in northeastern Colorado. And one of them was a big steer, and he investigated this case on his own. So he went through it with me when I asked on these series of Polaroids because I didn't fully understand what I was looking at. Imagine seeing a black animal with a bit of white on its face and the head only is dropped down in a hole about eight or nine inches deep. The rest of the steer's large body is lying completely stiff Each of the hooves and everything are neatly on the ground, not one sign of struggle. And I said, what is this? And he said, this one really got to me, Linda. He said, we approached, and you can see what a dusty, powdery ground is around this animal. Nothing, not a rabbit, could have approached this animal without leaving signs of tracks, and there was nothing. He said, that's the first thing we approached, we did a 360, we're looking for signs of tracks, and there's nothing. And this is a big animal, and it's lying on its right side, and its head is down in a hole. There's no sign that those hooves moved a quarter of an inch. What the hell happened here? So he said when they got up closer, and they're looking at an ear missing, eye missing, tongue the genitals, the rectum, and in this case, the tail had been removed right at the base of the tailbone in a very smooth, glossy, glistening cut. And I've seen this in in many photos. And they haven't a clue, but Sheriff Graves said to me, Linda, this animal was warm to touch, and there's not a drop of blood on any of this. And he said, what else can you conclude except that this animal was lowered or something to the ground? But on top of that, he said, that head in the hole, what can we, what can we conclude except that something had the ability to hold that big steer in place on that ground and took these parts away but left the head movable? And that in the agony, that steer moved that head, digging that hole with its own head until it died. Now, when I saw that as the first day of introduction to all of these animals, at first it was spooky scary, and then I felt anger. And in my anger, I felt strength. And in my strength was a determination to understand what could be behind something like this. Are we dealing with something that is absolutely evil and insidious? Are we dealing with something that is desperate for survival? What are we dealing with? And with those questions 
curiosity has driven me more in my life than anything I know, the next phase began, and that was no matter how repulsive the landscape or the body in front of me, it was my curiosity to answer those questions. Am I dealing with something that is evil or am I dealing with something that is desperate? And eventually, by the time I did A Strange Harvest, the documentary that was broadcast in a 90-minute special for the first time on Channel 7 in Denver, I had come to an intuitive feeling that I was dealing with clearly what the sheriffs had said, extraterrestrial biological entities, and that the murkiness of agenda became confusing because I was getting mixed signals from people who had crossed my path were clearly coming at me from the government. Right. Some wanted me to go down the path that it was all evil. Some wanted me to go down the path that it was all survival. Others were trying to deflect me entirely. When you, as a, uh, an investigative reporter and somebody with my background in science and medicine, are confronted with people coming at you from every direction trying to deflect you, my response is back up. Don't go any one of those directions. Keep learning more, trying to find my own independent knowledge path. That has protected me more than anything, Jimmy. And it reminds me of uh, Jacques Vallée, who I respect greatly. He and I had a deep conversation about animal mutilations and extraterrestrials on or around the time of the broadcast of A Strange Harvest, and we continued to discuss many things. And he said, look, after you've done this work, and as far as I'm concerned, he said, you are absolutely reporting the facts. You're going to have a lot of people sit your way by the government counterintelligence because they don't want the public and the media to know what you're reporting validly. You're investigating. You're doing hard investigative work. You're trying to go the science and medical route. You are trying to do this the right way, and that is what is going to bother the government the most. When they put out the phony, the phony explanations of satanic cult, predators, disease, right. they know that 99.5% of the media and the public will accept it and turn the other way. What drives them crazy are the tiny minority of people who think for themselves, who want to actually know the facts and the truth, and continue to go forward independent of whatever the government is trying to dish. You know that. Art Bell knows that. I know that. A (laughs) bunch of people who have tried to find truth and facts and report them knows that is true. Well, where I ended up, and here we are in 2014, every single year I have been surprised by more depths of information and revelation. But as more depth and revelation has come my way from a lot of people who have been facing death and have wanted to seek me out and have never gone on radio or television, but I know they have told me the truth. The agenda issue becomes even murkier, murkier, uh, less clear, because I can say this, Jimmy, I think with some confidence. Our government has known for a very long time that there are at least three competing geopolitical, territorial, extraterrestrial groups and they use time. They can manipulate time. And once you begin to realize that you're dealing with advanced intelligences in this universe that have been interacting with this planet perhaps since before the time of the dinosaurs, as I have been told by more than two people, and that the terraforming and the manipulation of this Earth from everything from sustenance to minerals to energy to communication to all kinds of reasons, you realize that this is not the only planet that has had this kind of interaction. And if we knew the truth, as we're now hearing NASA say we're going to find an Earth-like planet soon, that there are many planets that have been interacted with and terraformed by advanced intelligences, but they're not all interacting for the same reason. 
Right. And that when it comes to the animal mutilations, in the last year or two, it is becoming clear to me that a whole subject that I used to not take so seriously, I now think is at the heart. And that is the hybridization, cloning and hybrids on this planet, because something out there is desperate. Something has happened in their reliance on hybridization and cloning. And the DNA that they have is coming to an end. This has come up in the RAF Bentwaters subject with uh, Jim Penniston. This has come up in maybe 20 or 30 human abduction cases I've investigated. Mm -hmm. And the words may be different, but the idea is the same, that there is some intelligence out there hugely advanced. They know how to manipulate time, but what they can't do is stop the entropy of their own DNA because they went the wrong path with hybridization and cloning. And right now on this planet Earth, we can talk about the source of Homo sapiens sapien, but let's just address where we are in 2014. What's coming at us rapidly is cloning ourselves, cloning life, building organs from stem cells. It may be that humans will be able to handle it credibly, responsibly, but maybe not. And so when I answer your question today, I am doing the work I am doing because I am now more concerned about where humanity is headed than I am by the non-humans that probably set us in motion in the first place. I don't. I can only imagine uh, with the amount of email that I get every day. Uh, I can only imagine what you get every day. You've been doing this for a long time, and you touched upon this earlier. So I'm just gonna let's back up a couple of steps. How do you uh, how do you separate w- the information that comes at you? as as being real or not i don't want to use that word disinfo it's it's overused and that's not really what i mean but you know you need to separate you know what is real and what is not you are confronted with it every day you you've been at the center of some pretty crazy situations over the years and i don't need to bring up you know doty and benowitz and all that stupid stuff that happened well and a lot of that was absolutely factual But it was dangerous, dangerous ground because they were trying to uh, they were trying to give me enough to go too far. And if you go too far, then they can lasso you and hang you up to dry and you've lost all your credibility. And I think I think it's fair to say I never went too far. Exactly. And how, you know, somewhere you had to. uh to, to learn to measure the barometer of the yeah. information that is coming at you. And, and certainly back with, you know, in those Doty days, some of it, you know, some of it's real, some of it's not. You A don't lot know. of it is real in, in hindsight today. Right, exactly. But you didn't, you know, you don't know. No, it's right. And yeah. I'll tell you, too, you could use these two big separators of cream. Uh, let's go the uh, let's go the peop- the route of the people who contact me by phone or mail or email or whatever the route, and say that they have done X, Y, and Z work in the military, and they give me years maybe, and they might give me a country. When I follow up, and I'm always asking, may I have your phone number? I will never give it to the public, and I do not need to use your name publicly but it is important that I be able to talk with you. In the first conversation with people, I also ask, you get a lot from voices, you understand a lot from syntax, you know whether you're dealing with somebody who might actually have been a senior executive in a corporation or a colonel in the military, depending upon their language. But the next thing is, I ask everybody in the military, would you please send me a copy of your DD-214? I will never use it without your written permission, 
I will always blank out the Social Security number and any personal numbers, but it is vital to me that somebody prove to me that they are who they say they are and that they have a DD-214. And when you run into any kind of resistance there, if you're talking with somebody from the military, that is the first huge warning flag. On the civilian side, something that's quite parallel, let's say somebody calls up and says that they uh, have information from a lab that they've gotten, let's say that they've uh, studied some exotic material and they've sent me an email, and I ask for a phone call so that I can talk with them. And on the phone, I say, I would like to uh, go through from my private files the full spelling of your name, your actual hard address. I will not use it, but this is important. And then your academic background. What degrees have you earned in what institutions, what years, and in what subjects? And I think now in my career, uh, three people who had sent me even the something that looked like a letterhead with PhDs after their name. Right. When I actually ask those questions on a phone in person, and if they lie to me on the phone and they give me a phony university... I always follow up. So I have caught three people who did not have PhDs. And when you catch anybody who is trying to pass themselves off with a PhD, I'd never have anything to do with them again because I'd never believe them on anything, right? That's that's right. That's right. And so you begin to separate the wheat from the chaff in these reality checks. And if you go with me in a 90-minute in-depth interview that's recorded, I think it would be one in a million who could get through those 90 minutes with me lying. You're making me nervous. (laughs) You know what I mean. (laughs) Yes, I do. So it's... It's the, it's the people that I spend that time with, I have already decided that it's worth doing on a whole bunch of other clues that have come through just years of work. So that when you get down, George Nori asked me, how do you get these interviews with these? Well, it's because you only record with the people that you have gone through some vetting and you have some background, and you have a context, and they are telling you about the metallic scraping sound that they heard filling the air when they came home from their job in a high executive position at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, right? Right. It counts. Context, employment, education, background, DD-214s, and then... In the general civilian population, if people are describing encounters with high strangeness and they back off drawing for me in color and sending it to me through the mail or email, I think that also separates because the vast majority of people who honestly have interacted with all any kind of high strangeness, they want to draw it to record it. They want to talk to somebody who has had experience with other people. And it doesn't mean that they are desiring to have their name out there in the world, but it means they want to get this off their chest. They want to show you what they saw. So the people who won't go that direction either, those are red flags. All of those are ways that I, myself, I find I get to people that I think are absolutely genuine, telling to the best of their ability the truth with high strangeness. And in scientists, uh, the uh, issue of uh, PhD separates them out. Have you ever been snowed? You ever catch somebody where they they took you down the road and you were there and, and you gave them your oh, confidence yeah. and then boom? Oh, yeah, but... I never, ever, I I mean, when I find out that I'm working on something and I've got a really serious contradiction and I ask somebody directly, I'll give you one example that happened, this was about only seven months ago. 
Um, this is a phone call. I'm working hard. A phone call comes in, and this breath, was, it was a male. Linda, Linda Moulton, how? Oh, my God, I am so glad I reached you. I am on a beach in uh, Florida, and uh, I am near Fort Myers, and there are UFOs, and they are coming in and out, and they are landing in a swamp, and, it, and I'm giving you an example. This is the way the conversation began. Okay. And I said, tell me where you are. Well, right now I'm near Okefenokee Swamp, but uh, I live near Fort Myers, and I'm seeing this all the time, and they're going in and out of the water, and uh, there's somebody here that can get on the phone also, and we can tell you. And, and there was something about the breathless nature of it all that was just a little alarming, and I said, well, I work with somebody in Florida. They have a military background. He often helps me on cases. I don't think he lives too far from where you are. May I ask him if he could come and visit you? And there was a hesitation, but all right. So this was arranged, and the next thing I know, I got an email followed up by a phone call from this very trusted, analytical, bright Navy guy. He said, Linda, this was really hard to believe. I don't know if this person is just totally that ignorant or if they were trying to run the flag up the pole. But he said where he took me, these were planes with clear landing lights, and he gave the name of the airport. He was watching through binoculars. And this is an example where people will also videotape and photograph planes and sometimes they will mess with Photoshop and I guess they want to test about whether or not uh, these kinds of things will go by some of us. Well, the truth is there's a group, uh, there's the Navy guy, there's a bunch of us. We are very, very leery about images. And here was one where it took one trip. It fortunately didn't involve much time on the part of the Navy guy, but it only took one hour of time to realize that here was somebody that either couldn't see, needed glasses, or was just trying to be a jokester, and and that's all he could show were airport lights. So these are the kinds of issues that do come up, and of course, I'm never going to be reporting about anything like that. Did uh, Did he believe what he was seeing to be extraterrestrial, or was he? Do you think he was just trying to kill some time, and maybe he was bored? Well, that, the Navy captain asked me too. He said, since it was so blatantly plain, and he said, and even when I showed him through the binoculars, here's the plain, here's the green, here's the white, here's the red, here's running lights, here's everything that this person was resisting. Sometimes I think that there are people who become sort of slightly hysterical about seeing something in the sky and they lock into the idea that they're seeing a UFO and they don't want to give it up because of the melodrama of it all. But those are so few and far between. And Jimmy, I'm sure that you know that. The vast majority of the real eyewitnesses, they are more hesitant. And once they talk with you and realize you're not going to go off half-cocked and that I've got rules that I'm living by in terms of interviews and what I'm reporting, then they become comfortable and you learn a whole lot. So I think it's the people who are sort of uh, breathy and and the UFOs are coming in and out of Okefenokee Swamp. Right, Those right. Are automatically are big question marks. And this goes to the heart of what you're asking. I think you and I and Art and others, you begin to get a sixth sense about the patterns of voices, syntax, what people are describing, uh, the the kind of approach to what they have seen, and you end up distilling down to the people that really truly are credible. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, I I miss the. I'm I'm so wrapped up in this, I I miss the break at the top of the hour. Let's take a break. (laughs) 
<laughs> and and when we come back, uh, let's talk about India. Okay, and, and great. Let's, and let's talk about some other stuff that you're working on. Also, I wanted to I want to visit one subject that I think you were talking about last month, but I want to go back and talk about uh, the dragonfly drones, if you don't mind. Well, be, remember, I'm having to get up at 5.30 to go to Philadelphia, so we've got just this next little segment, or I will never get everything done. But what we should do is schedule a whole show to go into all these complex subjects. Absolutely, absolutely. And and for everybody out there, uh, Linda uh, warned me. She's flying out first thing in the morning, and yep. so we are very, very thankful that you uh, – that we figured out a way to get this done tonight. So let's. Uh, well, y- yes, and after the break, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Joshua Tree as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, we're going to bre- we're going to be broadcasting there uh, that Friday night. So I hope you're oh, going to. Cool. Yeah, I hope you're going to be there Friday. Maybe night. we can do something together then. Absolutely, we will. <laughs> of course, that's the plan. Okay, so let's take a quick break. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. You can certainly tweet right now at J Church Radio. Uh, the tweets have been coming in and there's lots of questions for, for Linda, but we are on very limited time. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Hi everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Metal God on JimmyChurchRadio.com What's up? My name's Brian Taylor, Ninja Badass Extraordinaire, and this is JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hey, J-C-R, in your face. JimmyChurchRadio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network, the spoke radio for the masses. Follow us on Twitter right now, at JChurchRadio. Hashtag DMRadioNet. We are talking with Linda Moulton Howe. And, Linda, before the break, and you and I were talking, actually, uh, yesterday and today, India, I I spoke about this last night on the show, and it was – I was – very happy to see that jump into the mainstream media for India like it did. Um, and we're talking about the 10,000 year old uh, cave paintings there. Do you think now let's, let's talk about this, but the first question I have for you on this, do you think they may have jumped the gun on this just a little bit because they went UFO ET right out of the gate? Well, from my point of view, my very first reaction upon seeing the Times of India photographs and their photographer took these photos was seeing the uh, being with a very large head, the large black slanted eyes, four fingers on each hand, right. four to- toes on each foot. If you go back through the last 30, 25, 30,000 to let's go, uh, Neanderthal, even in the caves there, The literalness, meaning that when you look at the bisons, when you look at the animals that have been painted in the caves on the French and uh, Spain border, my God, they are just meticulously detailed and accurate. And when you look at this 10,000-year-old, these cave paintings that have just recently been discovered and are so fresh, and you realize that there are four fingers and four toes, big black eyes, big bulbous head, very long torso, short legs. You are looking at what the modern world calls a gray extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. So I understand the Indian archaeologist. But more than that, when I saw that first image, what immediately went into my head was a case that I worked on for two years in Colorado a husband and wife, their car was lifted right off of a highway uh, up in Longmont, Colorado, outside of Denver. They were transported in a cerulean blue the beam. That was the word that the husband used. He was a commercial artist, and he said it was cerulean blue. And they both were 
um, examined and communicated with two different uh, types of beings, but the one that the husband dealt with had yellow gold clothing, and the beings in the cave in India have yellow gold clothing. They have big rounded heads. The pear-shaped head is this particular type in Longmont, Colorado. The uh, craft, the couple saw the craft that they were transported to from their car. It had appendages below it. It had a ring around the outside. It had orange light coming out of it. When you go to the cave in India, dated at 10,000 years, you're looking at red color. It is a ring. It has circles in the ring. It has three lines coming down that could be tripod or beams. And I, my mind said, this is not, you're not stretching to look at these cave paintings and go to the modern world of what people in the abduction syndrome themselves are illustrating from what they've encountered. And this is consistent with a man who retired from the Defense Intelligence Agency and went uh, to somebody he knew in the World Bank who approached me in 1999 because my book, Glimpses of Other, of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, had come out just a few months before. And the meeting was put together. I had to travel. They traveled. And bottom line, I had material in Glimpses, Volume 2, that the Defense Intelligence Agency man said I thought was the highest classified secret in the United States government about extraterrestrials and their cloning technology and the types that do the cloning and the hybridization. And he said, Linda, I have proof from my work 23 years monitoring and studying extraterrestrial biological entity geopolitical territorial conflicts here. I have proof that at least three civilizations have been using and working this planet for more than 270 million years. Mm. And I said, sir, that's before the time of the dinosaurs. And he said very quietly, they made the dinosaurs. Interesting. When you get to that level, Jimmy, and and you know that you are with somebody who is telling you the truth. You'll never, ever be able to have them in public, but you know they are telling you the truth. Right, right. I don't know what the evidence is. I asked, and he said, I could never tell you. But the hard evidence, I am, I am in, in, in a position looking at these cave paintings and saying that there are others. There have been the Val Cominica uh, in Italy. Right. There have been places where there have been geometries and beings uh, that have been inside of caves that have been discovered, and you will find that somehow, academically, these extraordinary archaeological discoveries just get put down very low on priority lists of research, and you say, what has happened here? Well, what has happened is the government policies of denial insert and make sure that politically it will not be acceptable for some of the extraordinary extraterrestrial evidence on this planet to be presented to the world because they are afraid of all sorts of social and religious collapses. My position, and I think the Indian archaeologist's position is, this is a reality on this planet and that we have to learn how to come out of the lies We've got to face our own history. We have to face the fact that this planet has been terraformed and worked by extraterrestrial civilizations, as that man said, for more than 270 million years. And Homo sapiens sapiens, this current model, is only, uh, give or take, 35,000 years overlapping with Neanderthal. And here is a sobering question. Do you think that Neander, it's called Neandertalensis, or Neanderthal, do you think Neanderthals had a clue they were being replaced by Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, sapiens? Oh, of course not. Of course so, not. So, dot, 
da da da. Yeah, well, <laughs> what you know, could th- be coming next here? Well, this is the thing, and when it comes to orthodox archaeologist uh what really i, I want to use a bad word here but w- what really makes me angry with that is when you look at a 10,000 year old painting on a cave wall like that uh, it takes a lot of work 10,000 years ago to do that and it's very deliberate and it's done for a reason and they 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 are preserving something, and it is very important to them. It's it's not a it's not a cave painting of a like you said. It's not a, of a bison or of a horse no. or of a rabbit, a scorpion. No, these were their teachers. Right, these right. Were, they're gods, and humans have to get over getting down on their knees to extraterrestrials. <laughs> that is one of the big problems. Extraterrestrials are probably what the biblical literature is all about. And we, not that there's not a divine field, not that there is not a force behind all creation. Every ounce of my soul knows that. The pura vida, that which is the life force, that would be what would be the source for all life, no matter how advanced or how old or another universe or another timeline. But what has been written about in the last 30,000 years by humans has largely been extraterrestrials. These cave paintings, that's what these are. And when are we going to grow up to be past all the policies of lies and denial and face the fact that we're not alone in this universe, we never have been, and that there are all kinds of intelligences out there. And NASA just held a press conference to say that they think with the Webb telescope that's going to be in operation, that we are so close to finding an Earth-like planet. Why is NASA interested in that? Their own press conference, they're looking for other intelligent life on another planet in the universe. Well, and I say this all the time. We, one of the things that we do here is we are looking. We're always looking. We've got telescopes. We've been doing it for thousands of years, looking to the stars and wondering, are we alone? Looking to the stars. And our first chance that we get, you know, out of the gate, 1969, we put Armstrong on the moon. Well, supposedly. And so we put (laughs) Armstrong on the moon. It's what we want to do. We want to explore. We want to go the other direction. And it's insane to think, for anybody out there, to think the opposite, that they couldn't be looking for us. Now, of course well, they are. And it's insane to think know, that I've they're not. I've been exposed to extraterrestrials made us, and that's the subject for a gigantic program. But as we're closing out, I would really recommend that all of your listeners, tweeters, Facebook, everybody, please go to my Earth Files report. It's it's under science. It's freely available to the whole planet right now. And look at these photographs and then look at the photographs that I have put in this report from the November 1980 Colorado abduction of the husband and wife in their car. And contemplate that the color, that vivid yellow gold color, That is in the cave painting 10,000 years old in India in a very rural, I mean, we're talking about inland India, nowhere near any large place anywhere. And here is that yellow gold with those rounded uh, sort of pear-shaped heads. And then you look at what the Colorado uh, illustrator, he was a commercial artist, illustrator, what he drew of what he was looking at yellow, gold, uh, some kind of a a jumpsuit with a a ruffled collar or layered collar that could be like what those beings are wearing on that 10,000-year-old carbon-dated cave. And then you look at the craft that he and his wife entered with the struts down below, what looks like a ring and a disc, and you look at what is painted inside of that 10,000-year-old cave, Mm -hmm. also done in red. We don't know why it could have been a red light in 10,000 years ago and an orange light in Colorado in 1980, but the same type of craft. Right. And this, to me, is where all of us, we need to be studying comparisons between what real humans are reporting now and being able to look at everything possible 
in the ancient historic past. And to go out on this one provocative note, because I think it's one of the most fascinating uh, facets of all this phenomena that a military guy told me. He said, Linda, the Greek gods, that was not mythology. The Greek so-called god Zeus and the Titans were extraterrestrials based on this planet. And if we understood who, what, and why, we would understand so much about the evolution of humans and politics on this planet. That, to me, is exciting. We should all be able to be exposed to all those facts. Where are you flying off to in the morning? I go to Philadelphia. I'm speaking Sunday about Gobekli Tepe in oh, Turkey. Oh, my favorite and, subject. And, oh. and terraforming this planet uh, <laughs> by non-humans uh, tied through real hard physical evidence. So I'm speaking on Sunday and staying uh, a week after with uh, family and friends back there. Uh, it, it's funny that uh, uh, on Twitter it just passed Jimmy. Um, you haven't said Gobekli Tepe tonight, and you did it for me. <laughs> well, Gobekli Tepe is what I will be talking about in Philadelphia. And then in August, at Contact in the Desert in Joshua Tree, I will be doing a presentation that also is focusing on Gobekli Tepe, but I'm also doing another one on the taxonomy as I'm beginning to understand it through military whistleblowers of the non-humans interacting with this planet. And I will also be doing another uh, I'm doing three presentations, and the third is going to be on the extraordinary new information about hybrids on this planet, past, present, and future. So there will be a tremendous amount at Joshua Tree. I, I can't wait. We've, uh, we've given away uh, eight passes uh, to contact in the desert. We're going to do another five tomorrow. And getting our listeners out there, and they just need to understand how – how large and important contact in the desert really is and who is attending and the amount of uh, effort that has gone into this. It's, you know, it's like the Woodstock of, of uh, ufology, you know, and it's everybody is there. It's going to be a great right. weekend. Well, good, and I look forward to seeing you, and we'll just have to set up a, another show at some time where we can go on for a couple of hours on all these subjects, but I'm glad we were able to do this hour tonight, and uh, uh, I guess, finally, pray everybody for world peace uh, between Ukraine and what's happening in the Middle East it's a bit scary, it, and we need peace. It was a crazy news day, wasn't it? Just absolutely oh nuts. And uh, it, it, I'm glad that we didn't talk about that tonight. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, and it's, it's good to concentrate on other things that don't fuel all of the energy of war. But it, it is a, it's a sobering time, and uh, I, I just think sometimes if we pray for peace, maybe it will make a difference. Absolutely. Hey, Linda, have a safe flight tomorrow, and I will see you in a couple of weeks out in Joshua Tree. Thanks, Jimmy. Linda Moulton Howe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Linda Moulton Howe, thank you. Wow, that was great. Fade to black. Only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. This is Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Follow us on Twitter at JChurch Radio, hashtag DM Radio Net. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be back right after this. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will on the Dark Matter Radio Network. He's always giving it to you straight. JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network.
All right, everybody, welcome back. Hustling back to the chair. Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Bespoke radio for the masses. Shoot me an email right now to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Thank you, Linda Moulton Howe. That was uh, absolutely amazing. She is, she's got to be up. She's still got a pack tonight. And uh, she's got to be up at 3 a.m. And uh, so she came in tonight and uh, gave us an hour. Gave us what she could. And I, I got to say, I, 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 I just wanted to s- keep her out of the box and, and just talk about things that, you know, you just never hear from her. And she's always got great reports and great things to talk about. But, you know, I wanted to know about Linda. And hopefully uh, we did just that. All right. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Hashtag DM Radio Net. It's kind of funny, right before the break, what does um, what does a an MP3 file sound like when it goes bad? That's what it sounds like <laughs> when it goes bad. All right, I'm going to get to a bunch of email and also uh, MH117. I am going to open up the phone lines. We have a lot to talk about tonight. I want everybody's opinion on MH370 or uh, MH370, MH17. Uh, I've got my thoughts here in front of me. I don't know what to make of a lot of it, but uh, we are certainly going to be talking about that. So I will open up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. You want to talk about Linda, that's fine. Uh, If uh, there's anything else that you'd like to talk about, we can do that too. I'm going to go through some emails and uh, talk about these headlines today. Absolutely uh, insane news day. And, you know, Linda kind of hit the nail on the head, which is, you know, you've got to be safe. And I mentioned this at, at the intro of the show. You just never know what the day is going to bring you. You just don't know. And it's a, it's a crazy world out there. And when you hit a news cycle like we did today, I, I I I just can't put it into words. It's absolutely nuts. Let's grab this first call. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Hey, Jimmy, it's Rick. How's it going? Hey, Rick, are, are you traveling safe? Uh, Sunday, I finally get to go home. But uh, after hearing about uh, the airline, I, I think I might want to rent a car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, and it, think about. Uh, all those travelers out there right now, you know, Linda's got to get on a plane in the morning, in, in the morning, yeah. and, and head to Philly, and all of the airports tomorrow. Well, and, and tonight, you know, everybody is tripping, and I don't oh, mean yeah. I don't mean to be, uh, you know, funny about this or or be snippy about this, but it's really true. You've got to be thinking about this, and all. You know what else, Rick? I, I I hate to think dark, but, you know, something like this is successful, right? They actually brought this plane down with a missile, a civilian airliner. Does this just open up the door to uh, ideas? Hey, that's, you know, to terrorists, you know, or to anybody that's crazy. It's just like, wow, we can do that. Yeah. All well, right. You know, ever since... Here's, it gets a little twisted. Uh, ever since Putin got in office, uh, one of the first things he said, I want Alaska back. You remember that? Yes. Way back in the day, he said, I want Alaska back. And right now we're in Afghanistan. Russia has always had like this twisted bromance going on with Afghanistan. Right. And now we're walking around Afghanistan. They don't like that too much. Then they take over Crimea. And you got to figure back when Russia was Soviet, uh, Ukraine was, I don't know, uh, pretty much considered like like um, the Russian equivalent to like what everybody jokes about, about uh, New Jersey. Right. You know, I mean, you had Chernobyl, you had all this other stuff. Since the Ukraine took over its independence and all that, it's become a breadbasket. It is one of the largest food producers in that area, and they're looking at that, and they want it. 
Do you think, um, well, what's your, what's your take now that you've gone through a new cycle of MH17 today? Uh, what do you think happened? I mean, we know a missile brought the plane down, but what do you think happened? Um, not meaning to get too uh, Alex Jonestown on this. <laughs> it's okay. But, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Putin wasn't, uh, wasn't behind it. Well, I mean, he has all the motivation. He's an underhanded guy. He was trained to be underhanded by the best of them, the KGB. I mean, and now he's in control of one of the largest countries in the world, and he wants more. Do you think that even though uh, the world has their opinions on him, good or bad, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying in general, yeah. everybody has an opinion, uh, whether they respect him or they don't, they think he's crazy or whatever. They think he's, uh, you know, some uh, just just crazy KGB guy that is the uh, head of state. Now, whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't I matter. Wouldn't say but, crazy. I yeah. wouldn't say crazy. He's he's uh, he's on par with like a Bond villain. If he's crazy, he's on, he's on part of like a Bond villain. Yeah, and and but he's also very smart. And exactly. and before we you know think anything else, he he's he's calculated. He knows what he wants to do, and he certainly yeah. has his backers there in the Soviet Union. But do you think he would really do something that crazy as to bring down a civilian airliner, or do you think he thought? Maybe his forces were just shooting at another, you know, you know, Ukrainian military transport plane, and somebody made a mistake. Is that possible? Like, well, I mean, both are possible. But to really answer the question, you have to look at a uh, a risk versus gain. You know, risk versus reward. Um, <clears throat> in doing that, what does he have to gain? You know, he he. Now he has a great excuse to say, hey, Ukraine, you guys are just off the rails. How do I just bring you back in the fold? Because you guys are blowing up civilians and all this stuff. You know, you guys are nuts. So why well, bring you back in the fold? And then rather than being part of the European Union, Union, you're part of the Russian Union. I have this great, uh, uh, was it natural gas and gasoline uh, deal with China? The world will be great. And... Mm -hmm. If you have the average Ukrainian citizen scared to death of what their future is going to be like, I mean, we're we're afraid for ourselves from the outside of Ukraine. But how do you think the average Joe in the Ukraine feels right now? Well, I thought about that today, and I can tell you uh, that the average Joe in Ukraine is in shock right now. That the, it that that now we're shooting down that all of this dust up. Whether they're pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian, whatever that it, that it's come to something like this that now we're shooting civilian planes out of the sky, they don't dig that, pro-Russian or not. That is an that you know there's a certain zone that you don't go into. There is you want to you want to scrape and you want to you know go to war or have some civil unrest. That's one thing. But what you don't start doing is this. And that's the zone you just don't go into. And I think everybody, including Putin, knows that. And that's when I think everybody is, just needs to step back and take a deep breath and just make sure that this is all worth it because it's not. We well, see right now Putin is also going back to the old school 80s um, Cold War. Like, hey, I have nukes, you have nukes. Uh, piss me off too much, I'm going to push the button. You know, oh, you're going to push. And so it comes to the standoff. So right now, what he's probably looking at is, well, they're not going to push the button. They're not going to get heavy-handed. What are they going to do? Do even more of an embargo on me? Yeah, yeah, there's I, I, there's that. And this, so is, what you have to lose? and this is the other thing. And I invite everybody to think about this. We're talking about two Malaysian Boeing 777s now. Not one, but two. And with the dis disappearance of the first one, with all of the theories out there about what happened to that plane, all of it dark, none of it good, no matter what, 230 people died in that, in that crash or, or are missing. 
And but what what the facts are is it was another Malaysian flight and they're both Boeing 777s. I have no idea what the odds are with this. I have no idea. I mean, well, if you have 17 and 170. <laughs> well, and that's an interesting little irony right there. Yeah, it is. It is. And so you throw all of that into the mix and then you have to state the obvious and I'll do it. I'll say it out loud. Are these two related? What are the odds? And, and now, now let's just say it was by chance. Okay. Let's just say that for a second. Well, then you have to stop and, and just think, well, wait a minute. No, it can't be by chance. The odds are too great, too extreme. So I, I just, I'm throwing caution to the wind right now. And well, in, do you want to know what my theory is on 170, though? What's that? Uh, what I think it is, uh, there was foul play. And right now, <laughs> the world's trying to keep it quiet because uh, the person who did it, the government's know who did it. They don't want to say who did it because then it'll cause this big, giant, uh, it could be World War Three. I mean, you know. Well, are, it, but, but aren't we, right. Uh, well, aren't we looking at that right now with this? It's the yeah, same and thing. The thing is, is with this, <laughs> this one's not as easy to cover up. With one sending, you can just go, oh, I don't know, man. It was on radar, then poof, it was gone. Right. <laughs> you know, this one, you can't say that. One, it was over land. Two, people saw rockets. You have uh, the, the guy that tweeted you, you know, with the uh, with the radar evidence. I mean, if, there was no way you could dodge the bullet. Please forgive the, ton, the pun. <laughs> There's no way you can dust gold on this one. Right. Before getting out. Right, With right. 170, you can always just pull the Amelia Earhart. Yeah, you're absolutely you know? right. You're absolutely right. Hey, Rick, um, your your phone is breaking up just a little bit. So uh, okay. uh, I'll, I'll let you go for now. Have safe travels, by the way. And you know what? Oh. If you got to rent a car, brother, rent a car because you got four tires on the ground. And there ain't nothing wrong <laughs> yeah. with that. I'm right with you. Three kids living at home. <laughs> All right, Rick. Hey, hey, be safe out there, and uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow night, as always. Cool, man. Take it easy. Thanks. Cool. That's uh, Rick Sinnott. Rick Sinnott. Uh, that opens up a phone line, and uh, 323-825-5045. If you want to Skype in, you can do that as well, which is fade to black 14. One word. Uh, now, I was just looking over... Um, at Twitter. Now, I'm going to get to uh, some more stuff on MH117 right now, but I was looking over at Twitter, and JD just tweeted, and this came out today. He just tweeted, just read the New York Times story on MH17 and shocked me. Uh, they had intercepted comms between East Ukraine and Russian intel agents. Now, that that one twist in this story today. Now I happened to see the press conference and the I saw it live today, and that was the head of intelligence for Ukraine who did the press conference. And this is what he said today. Now I saw it with my own two eyes. Rick, I know you read this in the New York Times. I saw it and I saw him speak these words. And he said, and I'm gonna paraphrase, but he said they intercepted a bunch of cell phone calls. And he named the name of the Russian colonel that was talking to, I believe it was a Russian colonel, a GRU uh, Russian guy, Russian agent, and, and this colonel. And they were talking about the plane being hit, a successful hit. And he said, this is where... This is where I get a little bit nervous. He said, we are putting his cell phone number into the media. We are going to play everything. Everything is going to be in the media, the transcripts. Everything is going into the media. Uh, we are not playing around about this. And this is the colonel's name. And this is what went on. And, and then shortly after that is the chatter between these two about it being a civilian aircraft. It just made me back up and go, this guy's telling the truth. You don't go 
and say that you're going to do this, you're going to publish the cell phone number, name the colonel, and put everybody on notice at that moment unless you could back it up. And that press conference made me just shiver. He was not playing around. I'm talking about the head of intelligence for Ukraine. Now, you know, I don't know how much cell phone chatter is going on on the border there. And, it, you know, it's not some – we don't have a, a half a million troops there. That's not what's going on. I said we. They they don't have a half a million troops. So, And the cell phone chatter that fires up at the same time as this missile attack – then it's easy to, you know, you're not listening to that many phone conversations is where I'm going. So I don't doubt that they had the ability to intercept and listen to this stuff and have it that quickly. And for them to turn around, it's the opposite of the original uh, Malaysian disappearance. (laughs) Ukraine's not playing around. All of this information is going immediately out. I believe them. I do. The conviction and the way that he delivered the message was frightening. Now, there were 298 people aboard. Originally, it was reported at 295. Now, it's 298. Uh, I haven't jumped on. I've been doing the show, so I don't know if there were any Americans on board. Originally, today, I had heard 28, and, uh, and that number has changed. So I don't know how many Americans are on board. And if somebody wants to tweet that, if there's an update that has been going on, uh, I would like to know. But uh, 298 people on board. It, uh, it, it was over a town called Torres in the Donetsk re- region of Ukraine. And we're talking about extreme eastern Ukraine. And when Putin said today that it was Ukraine's fault, I I was a little taken aback by that, in that they shouldn't have any civilian aircraft flying through the Ukraine right now when this is going on. That, to me, was a little, uh, for, for all of the families that are involved and everything else, I thought that was completely tasteless. And I know he's a strong guy and a megalomaniac, and he can say whatever he wants, and people hang on his every word, but you don't need to go there. And he did. Blew my mind. But it was at 10,000 meters. Now, the question is this. What can shoot at that height? And it looks like, right now, it's the Buk, the B-U-K, and it's a missile that can go to 33,000 feet. Um, one of the reports that I saw today, and I, and I found this disturbing too, as well, um, that the plane didn't have a smoke trail, all the video that you see, it looks like it was just a straight explosion. And, uh, some of the specialists out there saying, no, you know, it it was probably something else on board. There was no flame. The impact was all when it hit the ground. I'm just, when, when Ukraine jumps out of the gate saying that, there was a missile. There was a heat signature. We have the radar uh, track that was locked on. And for them to come forward as fast as they did said to me one of two things. They knew exactly what happened because Ukraine pulled the trigger themselves or they have definitive proof that a missile was fired from the other side, from the opposition. But it was certainly a missile. And then to have all of this stuff come out on Twitter was mind-blowing. Uh, from Spain, Buka. And and the translations on that as it came in freaked me out, absolutely freaked me out. Could it have been some trigger-happy guy that just wanted to make a statement and, and, and cause trouble for Russia? Is that possible? You know, I know we all watch a little bit too much TV, Jack Ryan, you know, uh, uh too many movies and so forth suggesting something like this that could actually happen. But it is possible. Was it just a complete accident? And that's the question that, that I'm, was it just a complete accident? And is there going to be a fall guy and hopefully no, no ripple effect and some escalation of all of this? It's my firm belief that it's going to completely back down. So that's that for now. With that, oh, I wanted to do a couple of emails before I take this break. This one just came in 
from uh, JT. He says he's talking about Sukalos. Jimmy, the only reason he wears his hair so high is that he is very religious. What do I mean? He says the higher the hair, the closer to God. JT, I want another email from you. <laughs> because are you being serious? <laughs> because if you are, uh, okay. And then JT followed up, uh, I've worked all day, I worked all night, slept all day, and I haven't heard the news. JT, go click on CNN. I had to read that out loud. Uh, Ken Lipson just tweets, he says, if Russia shoots down the plane, NATO will take action. If Ukraine takes down the plane, Russia gains credibility. And that's that's exactly what I'm saying here. That's exactly uh, uh, what I'm saying. Eugene, again, no one brings up comparisons between videos, pics, black box, recovered, radar. We have with uh, MH. Now, this is the thing. With 370, don't forget, with 370, we don't have anything. It's all somewhere else, whether it's sitting on a, on, on a tarmac at Diego Garcia or it's sitting in Pakistan or wherever the plane is sitting or if it's at the bottom of the ocean. We don't have those black boxes. We don't have the cockpit recordings. We will have all of that, hopefully, tomorrow. It's all sitting in a field. And do you think... And I haven't heard any mention of this. Well, I haven't heard it in the last two hours. But is the uh, is the FAA and all of the authorities flying out of Amsterdam right now, Malaysia heading north, is everybody converging? Are we going to have our specialists on, on the boots on the ground tomorrow in this war zone? We have civilians out there walking in this field right now, picking up stuff and disturbing the crime scene. And that's what it is. It's a crime scene. But if, if that's the case, I mean, you know, what's the what's the deal with that? Is the FAA going to be there tomorrow? And do we have any business being there? I can't imagine with that little prop up Eastern Ukrainian government of separatists and uh, that are there now that they've got some kind of aircraft disaster specialists that are going to be on scene? I have no idea, but I don't think so. I did see the fire truck today that was that was there spraying. That thing was from like 1932, and there was only one of them. So I can't imagine what Ukraine has got to go in there and, and, and get to the bottom of this. I have no idea, but I'm assuming we're going to have the FAA there in the morning. And we will have those black boxes. We will have the cockpit recordings. And we will find out. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Only, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Bespoke radio for the masses. Follow us on Twitter right now. At J Church Radio. I'll be back right after this. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will on the Dark Matter Radio Network. He's always giving it to you straight. JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to Black. Spoke Radio for the Masses, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Shoot me an email right now, Jimmy, at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow us on Twitter, at jchurchradio. 
Butterbat says, but why is Malaysian Airlines so inept that they that they would even fly there? Now, this is the thing. It's at 32,000 feet, and there was a storm. This is the thing. And Butterbat, I agree. That's a Twitter handle. I agree with you. That's the first conclusion you would have to come to. What What are you doing flying over there? Well, they were avoiding a storm. And the last two flights for this same uh, flight, uh, um, Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, uh, the last two flights started south, and then they did one 100 miles north because of the storm. And then the flight today was 100 miles north of that. You could see the the flight path, and that's why there was a huge, huge storm. That's the deal. So they were avoiding the storm, but they were at 32,000 feet, and you're in a commercial aircraft. You've got transponders. You're assuming that anybody, let's, let's, not, uh, let's not avoid the conversation here. If you're going to shoot a missile, um, you're, you're out of harm's way at 32,000 feet. Make no mistake about it. Okay. Anything that is, that is going to cause you an issue at 32,000 feet is coming from a national level. You don't have some shoulder fired lunatic with, with some little Sam that he's some shoulder fired missile that he's, you know, taking down helicopters at 500 feet or a thousand feet. It's a, it is a different situation. It's a whole different technology. So it's a national weapon. What do I mean by that? It's a heavy weapon. It's something that is run by a government, by a military, with commanders and sensibilities and ways to track and know friend or foe. That's what you assume when you're a pilot flying at 32,000 feet. Hey, everything else that's in you know that you worry about is is something that doesn't get to you. That's why you fly at thirty two thousand feet, and you're not worried worried about it. As far as I know, as far as I know, at thirty two thousand feet, it's the first civilian aircraft that has been shot down like this with a surface to air missile. There's you know we we know what happened with Korean Air and. And when you're being followed by, you know, a fighter jet, that's a different situation. But we're talking about from the ground. So you're talking about a national weapon. That's what transponders are for. Things are tracked on radar. That flight path there is a known air corridor. That's why you fly there. And Kiev knew they were there. Everybody else knew they were there. Well, and so did whoever fired that missile. They knew they were there too as well. But that's why you fly at 32,000 feet. And that's why they were there. They were there in that flight path, a known flight path, a designated flight path because of the storm that was 200 miles to the south. These are the things that we know. One of the, uh, uh, by the way, the phone lines are open. 323-825-5045. 323-825-5045. You want to talk about MH17, Linda Moulton Howe. The heat signature and the radar data was cited today. And the radar system there, and it seems like everybody saw it saw the uh, radar lock. Everybody saw that. Everybody saw the heat signature infrared after the missile hit. And all of this was uh, put into the media so factually, so quick, you know, and to trace that back and to find out where the launch point, you know, the, the point source, where it came from, what side of the border is inevitable. We're going to find out about this very, very soon. And I don't think Ukraine has any issues right now with going public with everything. They better they better hope that it didn't come from the other side of the border, their side. All right. Bouncing over to Twitter. 
I absolutely believe fighter jets tailing the flight shot down the plane, not the missile system they had on the ground. Why would you say, why, what, uh, what is, is that a belief or that's from Eugene? Is that something that you know? Yes, so factual, so quick, almost like a planted story. Again, I agree with that too as well. It seemed too good. Email just come in from JT about his hair. The higher the hair, the closer to God is an old hairdresser saying, <laughs> my Nubian brother. Uh, it was all just a joke. I, I get it. Come on. I wanted to. Uh, but um, speaking of hair, please ask all of your peeps to chime in and see if they think Nori wears a toupee. I saw him the other day, and it looked a little bit crooked. <laughs> Of course, that's a toupee. That's got to be a toupee. Hey, you know, tomorrow night, John B is going to be on the show. You think he would disclose that? You think John B would let us know if Nori wears a toupee? I, I think I think Nori wears a toupee. Um, I'm going to see Nori uh, next week. Oh, hey, uh, next month. Check this out. This is what I heard. I'm going to go public. Oh, I can't. Can I? Should I? Nori always arrives in a limo. Do you think he will arrive in a limo in Joshua Tree? Now, I want you, I got a call coming in. I'm going to grab this. But do you think do you think there is a limo service in Joshua Tree, California? That's the first thing. Or is he going to ride in a limo all the way from L.A. to Joshua Tree. And I, that's got to be five, six hours worth of driving. I just got to know. And I hear I hear me in the background. All right, you're live on the air. Fade to black. Who's calling? Hello. Yeah, yeah, turn down the, uh, turn down the uh, uh, radio in the background. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. You're live. Who's calling? My name's Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Where are you calling from, man? Yeah, Pennsylvania. What's going on tonight? Yeah, I was just talking about UFOs tonight. Okay, let's do it. What's on your mind? Uh, I've seen uh, several UFOs. Hey, hey, Jeff, you've really got to turn that down. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> Only because it's just as loud to all of the listeners going back out on the line. Okay, there you go. You got it. Yeah, I use the remote control. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, you've seen several. Yes, I've seen uh, two very close, uh, and uh, I just seen one recently. Uh, when? And, uh, uh, less than three weeks ago, I was on vacation in uh, Virginia. There's a Blue Ridge Mountains. Right. And uh, also the very two close ones. One was a triangle one, and the other one I've seen was a an orb. Well, which Here's one? My, well, let, let, let's talk about the Virginia one first uh, because that was the most yeah, that was re what, most recent. One. Yeah, what, what what was that shape like? That was uh, just like a uh, light flying across the sky. In fact, I got a video of it. Send it to me. But, uh, uh, how do you send it to you? Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Jimmy at JimmyChurch.com. All right. Yeah, Jimmy. But it needs blowed up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just send well, it to we me. We were on vacation, and uh, we're sitting there, and, uh, you know, we're in Virginia, and you see the airplanes going across. Well, this is lower than the airplanes, and it uh, flew, uh, actually, it flew from the, uh, um, the Big Dipper and the North Star, it flew right between them. And no sound whatsoever. None. And it was very low. And it just flew across and disappeared. How and long that was did, like three, how three long, weeks ago. How long did it last? Uh, about three minutes. And did you shoot it with your cell phone? Yes. How clear is it? Is it, uh, can you, you make can it You can see it in the cell phone, but you can't. Pinpoint detail in it. Yeah, right. Well, send us send us the video. We'll get the team on it here, and uh, we'll check it out and uh, and see uh, what you got. I'm I'm very interested. Did it get reported? Was there any other reports? Uh, 
I looked, and no, there wasn't. It's kind of strange how that works, isn't it? You know, right. you, you would think well, that... Well, it was uh, very high up. up. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway and the uh, the other one. We were over 2,000 miles up, or 2,000 feet up, I mean. Right. And uh, you could see the lightning in the distance. Because uh, my, actually, I live in Pennsylvania. Right. I could see the lightning because I was talking to my kids at home. But that thing was just going straight across the sky. Interesting. Did, 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 you, you've got the email, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. All right. Let me tell you about very close ones. Absolutely. It was back in the 90s. Okay. I was coming home from work. I work at night. And, uh, Above the neighbor's house was an orb. It was a uh, light blue. And I'm guessing a normal house is probably 50 feet across. Well, this is probably 25 feet across. And it's still dark out, and I pull into my driveway, and I get out real quick, and I look around my garage, and it wasn't there. So I told the same story to my kids, and they had seen that same orb above the same house, but they seen it during the day. And it took off on them. When I got out, it, of course, it disappeared. Now, my other one was in, it was probably approximately 2003, because I had a 2000 Suzuki Swift. And I had my window down, no air conditioning. And this was dead above my head, just like Art Bell. Right. It was a triangle UFO. If I was a young kid, I was probably in my 40s. I could have hit it with a rock. Right. I'm telling you, it was only like 70 feet, 75 feet above me. And I stopped in the middle of the road. And I looked up, and it was right there. And I go to myself. I, I looked at it for about a minute or two. And I said, I better get off the road. And I pulled up probably 7,500 feet and pulled off into a driveway. And here's the weird part. <clears throat> I don't remember getting out. And I don't remember seeing it. What I remember is shutting my door and looking my rearview mirror and not seeing it. That's weird. I mean, and here's another weird part. part. It was probably about six months ago. You know, the one I just told you about the orb above the house. Right. Above the neighbors. It was the same color as the lights on each triangle that, of that triangle UFO. So what I'm thinking is, uh, on the Triangle UFO, isn't could that be a transporter? Well, I mean, what? But I think with uh, triangles uh, is I I think they're from here. That's, that's what, what I I'm think. Thinking. Yeah, that's that's I, that's that's what I'm thinking, and I think that technology is right there. Also, a lot of uh, uh, stuff that was seen was probably the F one seventeen over the years. And, but this you know, one is only, I'm telling you, 50 feet off the ground. Well, you know, I agree. Uh, but what I'm saying is we have been developing that shape into our own aircraft. And so it's quite possible that, you know, that that technology is developed into a lot of other flight systems. So I, well, but I, the I could. about the neighbor's house. Well, no, that's different. You know, I agree with you there. There's an orb, okay. And it's 25 feet across and it's. No, I didn't put the two together because it was years apart. Right. It was the same color as the lights on each corner of that triangle UFO. Could that have been a transporter? Yeah, it could be. It could be. I mean, could be. Could be. And here's the weird part because I talked to the neighbor. You know, after I talked to her, two weeks later, she moved. <laughs> she dis- Yeah, she disappeared. <laughs> hey, she Jeff. Moved. I don't even know her name. She's moved. Uh, hey, Jeff. Two I'm- weeks later. Hey, call back. I've got a bunch of other calls backing up here. So let me get to those. Thank you. And send us that video, will you? All right. I hope you can blow it up. That's all. Yeah, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. All right. You're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Hey, Jimmy. This is Laird Kevin from North Edmonton. No. Laird. Yes. Oh, my. How, How you doing, brother? Congrats on your picking up another shift there. Oh, man. Uh, well, you know, it's all, it's a labor of love. And, Absolutely. 
So, Laird, what time is it there right now? Uh, 10.15 p.m. 10.15 p.m. Now, I got to tell you, Laird, Laird publishes some of the coolest pictures ever known to man every single day. <laughs> And, and, and I got to tell you, Laird, you know, you know, you see me click like on almost all of them. I don't have the time to click like on all of them. Otherwise, I would. But um, I don't know. If I, I'm, I'm glad you're talking to me right now. Where do you get all of those fantastic pictures? Oh, I have friends uh, across the world, uh, mainly from Scotland, of course, my uh, ancestors' home. And uh, I, that's basically where I picked them up from friends and people I've connected with on Facebook. Right. And, what and it, once, in, once in a while, I throw one of my own in, too. Right. <laughs> what, what, what do you think, and your accent is exactly what I thought it was going to be, by the way. Um, <laughs> what, what do you think about MH117 right now? And, uh, and what are your friends saying? About the plane that was shot down. Yes. Oh, it's a bloody shame. It is a, it's just, I just, it broke my heart that that had to happen. My, my wife is from communist Poland. She immigrated to Canada back in the eighties, but she she grew up in, uh, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. So she knows the hard times with the, uh, with the communist system in Russia at the time. And she thinks it's Russia shot it down. Yeah, it's looking at it's, it's well. You know what? No matter what, it was a Russian missile too, as sure well. No, no matter what, there's there's uh, there's some guilt there. You know, uh, I totally agree. It's just a bad scene. The world didn't need this because now what's going to happen? Uh, there's going to be some confrontation now towards Russia from whomever. Yeah, you know, I'm hoping. I you know now that we're talking about. A civilian aircraft and civilian casualties that, you know, Crimea and whatever's going on in the Black Sea and the eastern Ukraine, that everybody just, you know, calmer heads are going to prevail and it's just not worth it. We need to back up. And uh, and I, I really feel that that's what is going to happen over the next week. I don't think it's going to escalate. I really don't. Well, I certainly hope you're right, Jimmy, because uh, the world doesn't need this crisis right now. If they want to keep part of the Ukraine for Russia, divide the country up. Let the rest of them join the EU or whatever direction they want to go in. And, you know, get it over with and let's just get on with it. That's exactly the way I look at it. Hey, hey, Laird, I've got a bunch of calls backed up. Can I get to these other calls or did you have a question got, for no, me? No, 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 my friend. Take care of yourself and I just love your program. Keep up the good work. Oh, you know it. Oh, I just, okay. Hey, Laird, keep publishing. What Laird publishes every single day are pictures of castles and really cool things over in Scotland and the UK. And I think Little Ireland is thrown in there for a good measure once in a while, too, as well. Well, of course it is now. (laughs) Thank you, Laird. You have a great evening, and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow night. Thank you for calling in. It's good to finally hear your voice. All right, Jimmy. Bye now. That was Laird from Edmonton. Let's grab the next call. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Hey, Jimmy. It's Rich in Vegas. Rich in Vegas. Not Rick in Vegas, but Rich in Vegas. How are you tonight, Rich? Apparently there's two of us out here. What's that? I said apparently there's two of us out here with the same uh, the same moniker. So. Oh, I, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So uh, what's going on tonight? I thought it was very curious that number one that um, on the anniversary of uh, TW8 flight uh, 800, which was shot down by a missile off of uh, off of Long Island uh, 18 years ago, that this happens again with the same air carrier from 370. That's just that's the first thing I thought of this morning when I heard about this. So I was curious about your thoughts on that. And um, well. You know, on eight hundred, did you have you researched that or? Well, you know, I was I was shocked actually to to hear that news that it was the anniversary, and you know, the, I hate to say it, you know, there are no coincidences, but it, it just does feel a little weird. And what you know, the odds of all of this stuff, you know, what are the odds? I don't want to run that in the ground. 
but it's something that is is right in front of us, and I don't think we can ignore it. What are the odds of two Malaysian Boeing seven seven sevens, you know, happening like that? What, it, in the United States, this is the thing. With all of the thousands of flights and planes that are here, I have no idea how many planes Southwest has. I don't know, but it's you know it's got to be in the high high hundreds, if not maybe a thousand planes. You know, and what are the odds of us having two back to back events like this? Uh, the odds are just crazy. And then when you throw in a little tiny country like Malaysia, I don't know how many planes are in. You know, Malaysian Air, I don't know, but it can't be that many. And what are the odds of that? You know, you keep throwing all of this into the pile, and we're coming up with some pretty crazy conclusions, aren't we? I would I would think so. And I would think that, you know, first of all, with, uh, with 370, there's nothing. I mean, an airplane, you, you were talking about that a couple of months ago with the fact that those engines are tagged. Every time those engines turn on, um, Rolls Royce knows where they're at, or even uh, those are Rolls Royce engines, but I'm sure GE has something like that, which is their contemporary. So, yeah, yeah, there's there's no reason for that plane, the 370 plane, to just disappear completely, and nobody knows where it's at. Somebody knows where it's at. The, and now this happens, and yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, with all of the real time telemetry that we have. And it's not only if you if you really want to think about it, it's it's in our cars now too. You know, it's I mean it's just everywhere, and the real time telemetry of of the, a complete systems check on an airline is something that goes on in real time, and it's something that we as as consumers and passengers of of air travel that it's something that we are comforted with that technology is there, that everything is monitored all the time and we're safe and it's okay. Well, okay, so if that technology is there, then how can 370 just completely disappear? And now with all of that on the table with 370, now we have MH-117, we better have all of this real-time telemetry right now. We better know exactly, this plane didn't fall into the ocean, it fell into a field. And all of the evidence is right there in front of us. So, and, and I, I, you heard me say this earlier. I, I have the feeling that the Ukrainian government is going to put all of this public within days, if not hours. Which, which we can, uh, Ukrainian government are we talking about? Are we talking about the ones that are backed by Russia or the ones that are backed by the Western powers? No, the the, yeah, yeah, no, not the separatists, not the Russian supporters, okay. but the Ukrainian government themselves. Because for them, and I hate to look at it like this, but this is a, it's, it's in a weird way, it's a victory. Okay, it's a way for them to say, look, this is what Russia's doing. They're arming these guys. They're giving them weapons that they don't know really what to do with. Now they're, you know, they're giving them tanks. They're giving them uh, surface to air missiles. Now we don't know also, but this, in a weird way, it's a victory for the Ukrainian government and for uh, the world to take notice about what is really going on on the border. If that was a Russian supplied weapon, if it turns out that this Buk missile carrier was something that was, uh, you know, that was taken from uh, uh, Ukraine last week and the news reports are out about that, that they successfully commandeered one of these. But if they did and they managed to, uh, drive this weapon and to uh, figure out how to control it, you would think that somebody from the Russian side, some technical expert, gave them advice on how to use it. Because, Rich, check this out. If you and your buddies got a hold of one of these, right, and you're out in the desert in, in Las Vegas and you jump on board, you're not going to be able to just sit there and tilt those weapons up, those missiles up, know how to lock on radar, no, you know, you're not going to know how to operate it. It's not a bazooka. You know, it's not a pistol. It's not, it's nothing like that. It's a very complex weapon. And that's when I, uh, I called it national earlier. You know, this is a national type of weapon. And so there had to be some, some type of advice, 
some advisor, somebody from the other side in Russia that knows how to operate this weapon because it's a Russian weapon. And if that's the case, then you're guilty just by conspiracy alone. Uh, they, I heard there, it, it's called a, uh, you said the book, it's called a, a Grizzly, the code name for NATO. Um, they have two locking systems, one's tracking, one's targeting. Um, the thing I've heard bandied about is the fact that the people that have these weapons really don't know how to use them. So I think, in my opinion, they were targeting something else and they shot this plane down. Um, they, they shot down a couple other of, uh, of Ukrainian uh, military planes in the last couple of days, the same general area. So yeah, does, I think it was a mistake, uh, and personally. But. Uh, okay, does uh, but a mistake doesn't make you not guilty. You oh, know, I agree. You okay. know what I mean? And and I know I can feel. Well, I shouldn't say I know, but I can feel that excuse coming down the road. And diplomacy's got to come into play here. And so when you uh, have to play this out when you're a head of state, and I'm talking about probably Putin here in this case. Um, you need to have your scapegoat. You've got to have your story in play, and you've got to be ready to go like that. And I can see it playing out just like that. We thought it was another plane. We thought it was military. The transponder was giving out the wrong information. We thought we were shooting down a Ukrainian transport plane. We are sorry. These guys are going to jail or, you know, they're going to be reprimanded somehow. And there you go. I think that's how it's going to play out, Rich. Okay. Yeah. No, I just, uh, I just thought the coincidence was very odd with the, uh, with the anniversary of flight 800 and then also being a Malaysian airlines flight. And we still have no, no, uh, concrete evidence of anything about what happened with, um, uh, with 370, you obviously we you know we've talked about Diego Garcia and what happened with that, and there's been rumors about the Israelis had a plane in Tel Aviv with the same tail numbers, looked just exactly like that. So yeah, it seemed very odd, actually. So it does, and it's and it's also weird. I've got another call coming in, Rich, if you don't mind, but it's also no very problem. odd that the uh, media doesn't talk about the obvious things. And and with you and the rest of uh, concerned citizens out there, we're not stupid. And it's the obvious that's sitting right in front of us. And when you're not talking about it, that means you're not talking about it for a reason. You know, either somebody is telling the media not to talk about it, you know, because I would think, uh, you know, could you imagine if I was on CNN? <laughs> could you imagine that for a second? Is somebody like me just talking about the obvious things? No, I would be shut down. And it just, you know, I wouldn't be allowed to talk about the obvious things. But I, I just, it, it's crazy to me. Uh, when I when I heard it was Malaysian today, it's just like, what are the odds? And then TWA 800 comes into play and it's an anniversary. That's a little bit strange. Why isn't all of the, that should be the headline. You know, that if you know what I'm saying. Hey, Rich, I think I lost you, but you have a good night. Let's take the next call. You, <laughs> uh, I have the feeling this is Dino. <laughs> How did you know? Because I unblocked the number. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Dino. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a, a fade to black show with, uh, without you uh, coming in to visit tonight. How are you doing? Well, thank you. Uh, it's a shame Linda couldn't stay later. I was going to ask her, and I you have to promise when she's on again that I can ask her whether she remembers having interviewed my father. I think she may have interviewed him back in 1980 when they found a mutilated cow about a mile from his ranch. Um, so I'll have to save that for later. Uh, if we could switch the subject, though, a little bit back to um, non-speculative things which is how do I continue to, I mean, Linda Moulton Howe is great. I mean, when I mention to people who are neophytes uh, on this exopolitical and UFO uh, imagery, the first thing I tell them is, well, we have very good people like Edgar Mitchell who are committed to telling you that something's going on, and we have Linda Moulton Howe who graduated from Stanford with advanced degrees. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so that's why I wanted to continue, if she had been there, to ask her about 
some of these areas we go into, like your underground Malibu base, I'd rather not speculate, but what do what Linda does, which is go there and find out. And I know you're going to do that. And I just hope after all this warning, they haven't rearranged the furniture, those who are trying to black out whatever it might be. You know what, you know, what's <clears throat> funny is I get, uh, I probably get around 10 emails a day from people that go and look at the base and tell me, that it's blocked out. Now it's blurred out and, and to go check it out. And then I go and look and it's still there and I reload and I make sure that my cache and, and that I'm looking, not looking at, you know, some stored uh, version of Google earth on my computer and clear it out <laughs> and, and reboot and, and take a look. And I still see it. It's, it's all there. So uh, I'm really confused about that and what other people are seeing and, I don't know if there's different versions of Google Earth out there or if they have the ability to control who is seeing what. I, I, I would doubt that. It sounds too complex to me. But I do get these emails every single day, and I'm, I, it scares me. And, and to be honest with you, Dino, to, to be really honest, I, I would love for Google to do that. Because then, yeah. then they're hiding something, and so yeah, then it then it shows that there's something going on. But as I told you when I called uh, another time, uh, there was this guy who was a whistleblower for Pacific Bell about eight years ago before any of this came out, and he talked about the big giant cable up on the fourth or fifth floor uh, uh, to the Pacific Bell building down on Mission Street in San Francisco, uh, where he had no access to it. He'd been a flame a guy for years, and he asked people, what's going on there? And after he quit, uh, it's been surmised that this was where all the Pacific Rim communications, phone, email, et cetera, go through and are filtered probably by some type of supercomputer. Uh, so maybe they do have the ability to, to I told you, I, they wouldn't even let me on jury duty, and I didn't open my mouth. It got me a little paranoid. Right, right. And uh, and I've I, never I, been arrested for anything. <laughs> I, re I remember uh, that story about uh, the uh, phone cable up in San Francisco. Um, I do remember that. What I, I, I'm going to have to go and research that guy's name and see if we can uh, get him to surface again. But, uh, yeah, I totally remember that story. And when it, when it goes to Malibu and it, with um, Stephen Bassett, one of the things that he said to me uh, – I think he said it on air, too, as well. He certainly said this to me uh, during one of our conversations, uh, private conversations, which was you got to be careful with um, everything that is possible for them to hide it, you know, an earthquake or just go and blow it, blow it up and blame it on an earthquake or whatever that, you know, you could potentially go out there and it, have it be gone. It's one thing to have it disappear on Google Earth. And for Google to go through and uh, present new images of it, they'd have to go out and run some new sonar um, and get their imaging together and remap it and republish that. That seems like a lot of work to me. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in that, you know, when you go and look at your house on Google Earth, and I know that you have, everybody has, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and you see that the images are two years old or three years old. And you know yeah. because you know your neighbor's car across the street, what he drove three years ago, and now he's got a new car. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's not like Google is, is remapping every single day and it's real-time updates on every single street on planet Earth. That's not what is, is going down. So for them to go out there and remap the coast just because of this, eh, it's possible. Um, is it possible for them to go in and doctor the images? Ah, it's possible. Um, well, if they have something to hide, what what extent will uh, the breakaway society that we're being told about and the black projects go to? Well, th there's that aspect. and But you know what's easier? It's just do a little earthquake. You know, a little nuclear Well, there device. was one up at, uh, wasn't it up at Reno just the uh, day before yesterday? Maybe they missed up on which fault they hit. They well, the <laughs> well, what was funny... <laughs> Don't forget that, uh, and Stephen talked about this on the air, he said the first day that he saw the uh, Malibu images, 
he went and looked and was like, wow. And then that very day, there was a, a, an earthquake in the Santa Monica Mountains right behind the base. And he was like, ah, yeah. here we go. All right. You know, and well, I, if we if, if we could mention Stephen, that makes a good point to what you're talking about. He mentioned recently on his website that there have been a cluster of deaths of people in the UFO community that are whistleblowers, et cetera, and that they've had these clusters before all of a sudden. And I can't remember the names now, but two or three individuals who are real active have died in the last few months. Exactly. You know, and he said that to me and he goes, Jimmy, you know, don't, don't, don't be scared, you know, don't be nervous, but you need to always be conscious of that. And my response to him was, you know, that's exactly why this is gone completely public. And that's why we put it all out there. That's why we put the coordinates there. That's why we put uh, date stamps and went as public as we could Twitter, you know, this radio show uh, Facebook, the website, and it went completely, you know, viral on all of the websites around the world. And I'm thankful for everybody to take notice of it because it is very visible and very public. Yeah, I think that 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 can protect you. And my favorite, I call her the cheerleader of uh, the whole uh, exo political movement, Carrie Cassidy. I'm in love with that woman. Uh, she just has an attitude, and she's been threatened apparently, and had strange things happen, but she just keeps traveling the world, interviewing people. And I love her for that. Yeah. She said to me, she said to me one time, uh, a, a few months ago, and I never forgot this. She said, uh, now, Jimmy, your show is good. It's taking off. Everything is great. Everything is cool right now. Just be careful. And I was be like, visible. Oh, Carrie, I was like, Oh no, it's all good. It's, it's fun. Is it? She's like, Jimmy, you don't even know. You don't even know about the road that you're on right now. I'm just warning you. And, you know, and now we look back at that conversation, Carrie and I, and we laugh and, and it's just, it's, it's a crazy world and you do have to be very, very, very careful. And, and I can tell you're a kindred spirit to me. You're a peacemaker, but you have to be vigilant. And I already told you, this is the first time I've been that paranoid because it's only been the last two or three years I've gotten seriously into heavy research. I do this all the time, and I think I've expressed to you in the past, I've never seen a UFO. Uh, but <clears throat> I think that Bassett has it right. He says, it's no longer about lights in the sky, rather the lies on the ground. No, that's exactly right. No, that is exactly right. And the, the thing is this, I was, uh, I was talking to John B. Wells earlier today, and he brought up something that I talk about on this show every night, and I was shocked. And he said this. He said, ever since he has left uh, Coast to Coast, and I'll have him talk about this tomorrow night. It's, uh, it, I think I told him to remind me to bring up this subject tomorrow night. And it's this. He said, ever since he's left Coast to Coast, uh, I had asked him, I said, so how's Caravan at Midnight? What's going on with you? you know? And he said, you know, the weirdest thing, ever since I've left Coast to Coast, we, all we have is computer problems, camera problems, software mm-hmm. problems, phone problems. Everything that could be messed with seems to be messed with every single day. And I don't get it. I, I cannot get through a day uh, without some problems at the studio that can be affected externally. And if you stop and think now, now I was just like that exactly. It's the strangest thing. I know they're listening, you know, and I know I, yeah. it's, it's just totally strange to me. And it's, it goes back to what Carrie said earlier too, as well. It is just totally hysterical. We did this show. We did the uh, the sports show here, very same studio. Mm-hmm. And every single day, two producers sitting in front of me every single morning. Uh, we started our broadcast at 8 o'clock, 8, 8, 8, 8 a.m. At 6 a.m., they would arrive here at the studio. We prep and get ready for the day show. Same thing, three-hour show. Uh, no, actually, we did four, four hours. And um, uh, very complex, very technical. We shot video every single day. Um, So all of that was streaming. It was a very, as far as 
technical stuff goes, it was a very complex show to do every single day. But for years, we never had a problem. Not one. There was never an issue. Never. Nothing. And we start doing this show, and it, it's just like everything. I, I just take it. It happened at, tonight. You've dropped out three times on Flash Player. I've had to switch to HTML. Uh, and I have just recently upgraded to a faster uh, internet speed, and it, it, it's 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 crazy, you know. Now here, um, I, I, you bring up a good point. Here at the studio, uh, everything sounded good tonight. Well, Linda was crackling; it was a cyclical crackling thing. Happened three or four times during her interview. Not that big of a deal, but again, it wasn't like a flawless show. I didn't hear any dropouts, or I didn't hear anybody talk about any dropouts. That's strange, too, as well. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Twitter now. I have to wait for the 10-second delay to pass through. But I don't know if anybody else heard any dropouts. But, yeah, isn't that strange? It's, it's, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, I just and that's, that's the reason why, you know, like uh, Jesse Ventura says, you have to be vigilant, but stand tall. You know, speak your truth, and don't be paranoid, but... As I told you, this is the first time ever, and I was prepared to talk about some of this stuff depending on what the case was. I didn't even get up. I was one of the first people. They called my name before I got to the courtroom and said, dismissed. And I don't, I don't know. They said they had three active trials going. So I, I'm beginning to wonder if it's, I'm not being listened to now that I'm more seriously into this subject the last couple of years. You want me to say your phone number out loud over the air? <laughs> oh, don't you dare. <laughs> hey, uh, really quick, Dino, uh, what happened, uh, if you could, just tell me, what, why, did, uh, why did Linda interview your dad? And did you meet her back then? No, no, this was the thing. This was before I was seriously researching. And um, I will ask her next time she's on. <clears throat> I believe it was quite a few years ago. But it was in Northern California where my father was in a small cattle ranch. And when I came up to visit him, he had mentioned to me that some woman had interviewed him about a cow about two miles up the road from his ranch who had had these mutilations done to it. And he apparently was interviewed by her, and he said he told her, you know, I've been running cattle for many years, and sometimes after a cow dies in the night, the coyote or a critter will come and nip with their little front teeth and make little incisions. And he, now, if he were alive today, I think he would have loved to have heard that these are laser-like uh, incisions, and I think he would have been more open-minded to it. But at the time, he thought she was just blowing smoke because he, he'd seen a lot of dead cattle get their genitals eaten and their lips eaten and the soft tissues, their ears, when a coyote or something started chewing on them. Well, okay, I don't know much about what a coyote would would eat, um, but I don't think they would go for, you know, testicles first, would they? Wouldn't they just go well, for... Well, my, my father... Was I don't many, know. Many, I don't... many, many years. He was rode the ranges of Nevada, and he... Uh, he was a true cowboy. I mean, he'd been among the cattle, and he, he said he looked, told me once, I said, could I get into your business? Because I didn't grow up with him, see? And uh, he said, well, he said, I'll tell you something. If you want to be in the cow business, you've got to think like a cow. And what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> think about it. He said when he had horses, when he broke a horse, he said, you've got to think like a horse. Let, let me ask you this, Dino. Did your dad, after you know the interview with the uh, with the crazy lady, uh, you know the way that he put it, he didn't say crazy. <laughs> he just thought he was blowing smoke. Okay, so he, he was attracted to good looking women, and Linda certainly is that a good looking redhead. Okay, okay. So when when, but after that, did did he ever talk about uh, anything strange on the ranch? Did no? Did I think he, I told you the one story he told me was when I was very young. And I was helping him uh, run a dude string up in the Sierras during my summer vacation. And he told me about, the. I, I told her on a show a few months ago, about these two old-time miners. Right. You went into the bar, they'd, they'd fight you if you mentioned anything about UFOs or little men because they supposedly had seen uh, a, a flying saucer, a small one, uh, land way up in the Sierras in Northern California, uh, land... Uh, 
and go down into a creek one night because they were awake and they were camping out. Right. And uh, he looked over the ridge, and these little short men uh, with little round heads got out with a bucket and took a bucket of water from the creek, climbed back up the ladder, and took off. And? Well, that's the story. He just no, I remember that, the story. I, I, I'm uh, getting to the connection with your dad, that's all. Well, I'm just saying that that's the only thing he ever he ever told me. Because, oh, right, you know, right, 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 right. And, and, and if, if he told me, believe me, my, my father was a very open and direct person. He always taught me to teach, teach the truth and to, to stand up to BS. And, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, if he had seen something, he would tell me. But he, he just, he met people that saw things because he was outdoors a lot, but he never saw anything. And what about the other cattle ranchers? Did they have any issues? Uh, was it public? I don't remember. That's so many years ago. Right. And it was before I took, I didn't even know who Linda was. I think I might have heard of her. It might have been, it was before she wrote Strange Harvest, and I had not read it. But uh, I thought I had heard something about lasers. Uh, but, you know, <clears throat> I didn't have much of a toolbox to argue with him about it uh, because I didn't take things seriously. But again, that was about 25 years ago. Let me ask you this about uh, the interview with Linda. Did you, I, <laughs> I, I didn't want to, I wanted to talk to her about her. You know, we've all heard her on, on, on radio and television for so many years, but she's always talking about her research, which is great. That's what we listen to her for. But I wanted to just talk to her about her. Uh, did you get, did you learn something you didn't know before? Well, a little bit. I think I knew some of it, but that is your style, Jimmy. And I've learned to expect it that you know, like when you talk to Travis Walton, you're not asking him to tell the same story he's told a hundred times. You're trying to find new insights. And that's what I love about your program. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it, it's unintentional, but intentional at the same time. You know, I'm a fan just like everybody else. And, you know, I, it's, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to talk about, uh, maybe when you talk to Stan Friedman, you've got to talk about MJ 12 or you've got to talk about Roswell. It's what you do, but you know, and it's the same thing with Linda or anybody else that's on the show. It's an easy zone to get into, but it's also very rehearsed for everybody. And I, I just don't want that. I, I want to feel like I'm just sitting you know, I don't want to hear if she was a guest in my home and you hear me say this all the time, but if she's a guest in my home, the last thing I'm going to talk about is cattle mutilations. I want to know mm -hmm. about other things and I want to learn something new. And so, well, that's the thing. And, and if I had had the time and I would have been uh, given a third question to her, it would have been, you know, do you think you're spreading yourself kind of thin? Because uh, in my mind, she's still identified with, uh, um, you know, not just. Uh, cattle, but uh, people being mutilated or operated upon. And I wonder if, you know, she's got so many things on that website. I wonder if it strains her credibility. I think, um, of course, I can't say I would love to make a living in this field. I'm not able to. I have to struggle and work still. Um, but it's fascinating to me. And I think you ought to stay with what your area of expertise is. Now, Carrie Cassidy, for example, interviews all different types of people. She doesn't claim anything except when things happen to her. Um, and so therefore she can go across a gamut of subjects and uh, uh, topics. Whereas with Linda, I'd like to see her, you know, I wonder if it strains her credibility when I'm telling people, oh, here's this wonderful, intelligent woman who's been from Stanford and she's written books. And then she's talking about strange things like, you know, genetic engineering, which may be true, but I think there are other um, uh, UFO old timers that maybe present this better, you know, that maybe she's picking up the ball for them. I don't know. Well, that's a great point. And I will say this, uh, in her defense, and I was totally shocked when she said this to me today, I said, so Linda, uh, what do you think about the Malibu underwater base? She goes, well, look, uh, I've read, I've seen the stories. I've watched your video. She goes, look, I'm not going to comment on it at all. I only know what you know. She said, do I have an opinion? She said, look, I'm not going to give my opinion until I go out there myself and, and I either get divers in the water or we get cameras under there. And exactly. I, I look at it and I'll research it myself. Then I will comment on it. But that's I don't comment on anything or talk about anything until I have actually been there myself. 
I was like, you yeah. go, Linda. Whoa, whoa. She goes, yeah, I mean, that's what we want to see. That's what we want to see. And I'd like these astronauts that have been speaking to be, you know, keep pushing the same message. Now, I see on the Twitter feed here, a guy says he's seen black helicopters. I'd like to know descriptions of them more because I saw one near my home last year, but I was told it was a little small one, looked like it could only carry one or two people, unmarked, but it was flying around below the tree line. And I was told by, a, let's say, a local harvester I know, that uh, that's camp. So uh, what's the difference between the camp of black helicopters and those that uh, seem to fly over these UFO uh, uh, crash sites, et cetera? Well, there's always there's always <clears throat> there's always a point. I, I say this so there there's a there's a there's a something that fuels the fire. There's always a, something there. There's always a reason for it. And so when you have these very, very, very consistent reports of black craft, black cars, men in black showing up after something has been seen, reported, uh, talked about, and it happens time after time after time, then there is something to it. There's something to the story. We do know this. And I can bring my uh, Uncle Bill on this show to talk about this fact. My Uncle Bill, by the way, Bill Church, retired yesterday. Uh, congratulations, Bill. Congratulations. You made it. He retired after, and I'm going to take a wild guess here. He was in Vietnam in 68 and 69, helicopter pilot, went back in 70, 71. So that is, that's almost, uh, that's 40, 45 years ago. He was in he was a helicopter pilot for the United States Army for 45 years. Now, with that long career, he was a combat uh, trainer uh, in combat school. And he also did that over in the DMZ. He, he would tell it's all public information, so it's not that big of a deal now. But he would tell you that there are nothing... There's nothing flying around in the United States without tail numbers on it. doesn't matter how covert it is. And mm -hmm. so if it is something that doesn't have any markings on it, you know, and so I, I, I'll, I'll give Bill a call. I'll have him come on to address this specifically. Now, this is a guy. This is what he does. <laughs> this is what he does. And, uh, and he's a very decorated, very accomplished, very cool guy. Um, Sounds like the perfect guest that we would all appreciate him. And, and I keep working on Dan Aykroyd because he had an experience with Men in Black. And I'd like to hear more people who are experts about Men in Black. He had one guy on, but I was wanting to know more. Well, you know, I, I keep waiting for the visit, too. Um, I, was, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd want to wait for that in the middle of the night. I was with uh, a couple of uh, ah, I was with a couple of media guys a couple of days ago. Uh, it was on Monday. And uh, so we're sitting in this office talking about some stuff. And they both turned to me and said, so, do you have a men in black story? <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't. I don't have a men in black story. I don't. I really, really don't. I would, uh, you would have thought something would have happened by now. <laughs> but yeah. it hasn't happened yet. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm nervous about it. It's going to happen sooner or later, I'm sure. But, uh, I, yeah, I would love to be able to have my own Men in Black story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> God, it just makes well, as long as they can control your thoughts, then it's going to be scary. But if they can't control me, I'm afraid that I might retaliate before they got in the front door. <laughs> they better not come near me. You know, it's going to happen sooner or later. You know, we're going to get the knock. You know, I'll be somewhere and that, you know, I'll be trailed by some car. I'm sure it's going to happen. I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, I look forward to it. I relish the moment. I'm a little nervous about it, but I would love to be able to go and, and talk about it. So uh, I hate your seatbelt on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dino, thanks, man. All right. I'll listen to you again. I'll, I, well, it'll be tomorrow night, man. John B. Wells. Right. And, and don't miss it. All right. Sleep well. <laughs> All right. Dino from somewhere here in California, undisclosed location. You gotta love it when Dino uh, Dino calls in. It wouldn't be a, a, a show without him. Uh, I just wanted to read this email that came in uh, from BM. He says, "Unfortunately, this type of event and oh, this is about uh, MH17. 
Unfortunately, this type of event, i.e. terror groups shooting down commercial planes, may be our near future. Terror groups are gradually getting more and more sophisticated weapons. Groups like ISIS in Syria and Iraq have money to spend, and China, North Korea, Russia all have weapons to sell. How do we stop this? Hell if I know. And that is what I was talking about earlier tonight. The idea is now planted firmly in anybody with bad intentions that this can be done. And the amount of weapons that are just running around Syria right now with this capability, yeah, I doubt any commercial aircraft are flying uh, <laughs> through that area. But think about that. That is a crazy, crazy turn of events if, uh, if this kind of technology is now just available and ready to use. And, and I agree with BM and with Ben. That, uh, you know, if you want it, there's somebody selling it. You want to learn how to use it, and there's somebody that's going to teach you. And that is scary. I'm with Rick, who is uh, traveling right now on the road. He was going to fly back. I'm with Rick, man. Drive. Remember what, uh, oh, what's his name from uh, the Oakland Raiders? Ah, the coach. I'm, I'm brain freezing right now. But, yeah, he wouldn't get on a plane. He was all about a tour bus and, and, and going around the country in, in, in style. I, I, kind of, I kind of understand that. <laughs> I really do. Oh, man. Yeah. Second thoughts about uh, getting on a plane. I, I wouldn't do it tomorrow. That's for sure. So let's, uh, let's uh, wish Linda Moldenhouse some luck on that one. Coming up next. On Dark Matter Radio Network is an encore presentation of Night Watch and Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg and that famous shirt of his. Stay tuned. Night Watch and Spooky South Coast. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. I'd like to thank Linda Moulton Howe for coming in tonight. Thank you, Linda. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Apparently, she's the John B. Wells hacker. Show is, show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark D. Kovar. The announcers are Steve Harder and Mark D. Kovar. Music is this guy. Doug Aldrich. Show intro is performed by Space Boy. And I think we have some space oddity coming up here very soon. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, John B. Wells. Be safe, everybody. John Madden. I see you, Chico. John Madden. Good call. Good night, everybody.